I'm going to officially welcome you all. It's November the 4th, 2020. This is Almost Live Virtual Vocal Eye. This is our 23rd session. Uh, I, I can never believe that. I, I'm here for every one of them. And still, I think that that's a, an amazing accomplishment for pivoting through COVID times. Tonight's tour and Q&A is going to be super exciting. And I'm going to introduce that in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to do an official uh, recognition that we are broadcasting to you this evening from the Vocal Eye offices, which are on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. want to just your contributions to Vocali. Vocali offers this programming free of charge and those who have had the capacity to make donations, we are ever so grateful for that. For those of you who would like to make a contribution, uh, Donna is going to post a link to our donation uh, page on our website and we, we would be most welcoming of any contribution but if uh, but we recognize that not everybody has the means to do that so thank you in advance and thank you to those who continue to support vocal eye programming I also as is evident by uh, our guests this evening want everybody to know that everyone is most welcome to join us um, whether you're from the blind community or from the, uh, the sighted community, we're all friends here. We just ask that uh, first time participants register by emailing info at vocaleye.ca and just like let us know what your name is, where you're from, and if you identify with uh, being a sighted person or a non sighted person, and, uh, and you're most welcome. Tonight, we're going to get on with our programming. We're going to have our uh, traditional draw of a $25 Moose's gift card this evening. So we can stay tuned for that after the Q&A. And I just want to remind everybody that there is no programming next week, November 11th, which is Remembrance Day. So we will not have programming that Wednesday, but you can join us again on November the 18th when we have the Arts Club presentation of Buffoon. So we can all look forward to that on November the 18th. Okay. Virtual Vocal Eye, number 23. I feel like I need to have the, the sports uh, you know, song in the background. So this is our almost live event of Kent Monkman's Shame and Prejudice. Uh, oh gosh, it makes me tingle to just think of that. This is a story of, recon of uh, sorry, a story of resilience by Kent Monkman. And really excited this evening to have guests from the Museum of Anthropology joining us. And before I introduce them, I'm gonna bring in our own Steph Kirkland to the party who usually likes to remain quiet behind the scenes, but not tonight. We are bringing her out front and center to talk a little bit about how we're gonna unpack this evening's tour. So Steph, where are you? I'm here, Amy. Hello. Ah, you're here. Lovely, Hello. lovely. I was looking for you. So super excited about this, Steph. And I'm excited as well. It's <laughs> very, very, very excited. And I, I'd just like to uh, extend my thanks to the Museum of Anthropology and the Monkman Studios for making this event possible. Without them, we wouldn't even be doing this. So many That's thanks to them for that. Quite, it's, it's quite astonishing to uh, have this programming brought to our, our community. It really opens up the world of access to, uh, to art that we may not have had access to before. And, and before we go on, I, I, I want to just make everybody aware who doesn't know me that I identify as a, as a white settler. And so, of course, any that questions and thoughts that I have about this content is coming from that kind of lived experience. Right, Amy, and I as, I, and as well. So I'm going to be, um, I'm here to sort of provide uh, additional visual description for our community who are blind or partially sighted. And so I'm coming at that from a perspective that is non-Indigenous. I'm a white settler as well, and I have a theater background, so I'm not an art expert either. But I'm here um, to, uh, for a specific uh, purpose, and I ask uh, your patience and forgiveness for, for my limitations. Um, our descriptions are designed for people who are blind and partially sighted. So um, we do have a number of sighted guests joining us this evening, and you're, you're most welcome here. If I'm doing a decent job, maybe uh, your experience might be enhanced as well. We always aim for kind of a Goldilocks kind of description, not too much, not too little. And I know Amy's gonna help keep me on track in that regard. And the great thing about doing this event live is that after I give you some, just some basics, you can always ask for more if you need them. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the, the exhibit tonight is led by uh, the Museum of Anthropology curator, Dr. Jennifer Kramer. 
So this is a video recording that Dr. Kramer, uh, of, of a tour that Dr. Kramer led um, uh, just a few weeks ago. And so it's a video recording. And uh, so we'll be sharing that with you. And the recording also includes a Q&A at the end, which we're not sharing with you because we have some live uh, guests from the Museum of Anthropology who we'd like to um, speak with. But we will be sharing a link to this tour that includes that Q&A in the follow-up email after this event. So I urge you to check that out. And there will also be other resources there, including uh, interviews with the artist Kent Monkman. And I really encourage you to check those out. Awesome. So, so Steph, this is a, a unique tour that we're gonna experience. Can you give us kind of an overview of how the exhibit is organized? So uh, as, as Dr. Kramer will explain, but I'll, I'll give you an overview because sometimes it's, it's difficult to grasp it the, the first time around. So um, the exhibit is organized in nine chapters that cover about 300 years of this country's history from an indigenous perspective. Each chapter is titled according to the written excerpts of the memoir from the memoir of Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. Now Miss Chief is Kent Monkman's alter ego who he describes as a time traveling gender fluid trickster who bears witness to this history. And he often, uh, she, Miss Chief, often appears in the paintings and installations. I can give you a bit of a description of Miss Chief. What does, what does she look like? Well, what does she look like? <laughs> she looks a lot like Kent Monkman. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, it's certainly the face of Kent Monkman and uh, who has prominent cheekbones, dark eyes and a steady gaze and a somewhat serious expression, but mostly a, a, a very, again, the steady gaze. So my, my first inclination is to describe, uh, describe him as handsome. And this is a, you know, a, a value judgment. We don't usually use those kinds of things as describers, but looking up that word handsome, for a man, it means good looking. And for a woman, it means, uh, according to this definition I, I found, striking and imposing in her good looks rather than conventionally pretty. And it's kind of a word that I would use to describe both Kent Monkman and Miss Chief. So, but again, from a very personal uh, point of view. So stretching the, 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 the <laughs> stretching the bounds of description there a little bit. So Miss Chief appears in many paintings. She's, um, kind of, she's a statuesque figure, narrow hips, broad shoulders, washboard abs, and long wavy hair. And how do I know she has washboard abs? Well, she's often nude or nearly nude except for her signature black stiletto heels. These are not just any high heeled shoes. These are Christian Louboutin shoes. Uh, he's a designer and he's famous for these shoes that have distinctive red leather soles. And they're very popular with many celebrities from Angelina Jolie to Beyonce. So they're like red, uh, uh, red soles or red bottoms they're sometimes called. And uh, another recurring image in, in many of the works is the Hudson Bay blanket, which many of you may be familiar with. It's a creamy white blanket and it has four thick stripes of color at either end of the blanket, red, green, yellow, and dark blue. So those are some of the motifs that will recur in the nine chapters of the exhibit. So the chapters are, so they're titled, so the, the wall of the exhibit has the title of the chapter and then it has excerpts from Miss Chief's memoirs and they're uh, presented on paper that looks like it could be animal hide. And uh, it's, uh, and it's also in three languages, Cree, English, and French. So Jennifer will take us through 14 artworks by Kent Monkman, nine paintings and five installations. There's also um, works that Kent has uh, curated, he's uh, um, pulled artifacts from other museums and galleries that kind of represent a settler's point of view of the history, and they're in juxtaposition to the pieces that he has created. But this tour really focuses on his work. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? Am I... You're doing a great job so far, and, and give us an overview of how the evening's formatted, because we do have a video that we're playing. It is divided into nine chapters. So what are we going to experience this evening? So what we're going to do, because um, uh, the, the, this tour was, was designed really for sighted guests and visitors who were in the museum at the time, and then presented again virtually. So the 
what we're going to do is we're going to pause at the end of each chapter. We're going to pause the video and we'll be able to bring up a slide of the uh, some of the works in that chapter. I can supply additional verbal description. And then we have our guests from the Museum of Anthropology who may be able to shed even more light on these uh, works of art and, and, and sort of fill out uh, uh, Dr. Creamer's uh, commentary even, even more for us. Awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that because I have lots of questions and um, I love uh, being able to witness some of this art through uh, through others, actually. Uh, it's the only perspective I typically get. So, um, okay, I, I, I want to, before we introduce our esteemed guests from the Museum of Anthropology, Steph, can you just, there are nine chapters. Could you quickly just list the nine chapters for us? And again, I, I don't want our our friends from the blind community to get overwhelmed with, with this much content because we'll unpack it again, but just... Um, I think it's kind of important that we go in with a frame of mind around the names of these chapters. Oh, sure. So chapter one. So again, these are um, almost chronological. So uh, the first chapter is New France, Reign of the Beaver. And Jennifer is going to introduce us uh, to two works in this chapter. One is an installation and one is a painting. The second chapter, Starvation, also has two works, an installation and a painting. Chapter three is the Fathers of Confederation, and that oh, features one painting. Then we move to chapter four, the forcible transfer of children. There are two works, a painting and an installation. Chapter five is Wards of the State, two paintings. Chapter six, Incarceration has two works, an installation and a painting. The Res House, chapter seven, is the Res House with one installation. Chapter eight, Sickness and Healing, one painting. And then the final chapter is the Urban Res, one painting. So again, these, this isn't the complete exhibit, but this, these are highlights certainly from each of the nine chapters. Awesome. I'm really excited to, to dig deep into this. So while, um, right before we get started on the tour itself, I wanna invite our guests from the Muse Museum of Anthropology, who I think, should be standing by. So we've got Marie and Isaku with us. Are you standing by friends? Yes. yes awesome. I... Welcome to have you both. So Marie, I'm going to ask you just to introduce yourself to our audience, let them know what it is you'd like them to know about you. Well, hello, everyone. And um, thanks for coming out or staying in um, and uh, <laughs> showing up to the event. I'm really excited to see how this is going to go. I've never been part of an event like this. Um, I'm a curator of public programming and engagement for the Museum of Anthropology. And um, with that role, it's my um, great privilege to be able to help um, bring the most important elements of uh, the museum to the public in formats that can reach the broadest audience possible and in, is inclusive as the broad, uh, and, and is the most inclusive uh, and um, of the broadest audience possible. Um, I am a settler. Um, I have European descent and I am from Buffalo, New York originally. Thank you, Marie. Love that. Asaku, I know you're standing by in the wings too. Yes, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Please you introduce yourself. My name is Isaku Inami. I'm a settler and I'm a queer person of color. I'm a volunteer at the Museum of Anthropology since 2017. Um, I am very, very happy to be part of this event that um, uh, more inclusive, more accessible, and more people, as Mary said, it just excites me so much. And my heart's a little bit pounding right now. <laughs> yes, thank you. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for, for introducing yourselves. I think we're going to get a real treat having you both uh, on the line. I've I have witnessed both of you um, do other uh, Q&As with both Monkman and uh, Jennifer Kramer and uh, facilitate a couple of other tours. So I'm really excited to introduce you to our crowd of people tonight. So without further ado, it's seven on the money. Can you believe it? If I was doing a Robert's Rules of Order, I would be right on the money. So let's start off this video, which is uh, Dr. Jennifer Kramer and a tour of, well, the beginning of chapter one of Kent Monkman's Shame and Prejudice. Rick, can you play the first chapter?
Welcome to the Museum of Anthropology. We are here on the unceded, ancestral, and traditional territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people, who are our kind hosts. My name is Jennifer Kramer. I'm one of the curators responsible for the First Nations Northwest Coast collections here at the Museum of Anthropology. And it's my privilege to be touring you through our most recent temporary exhibition, Shame and Prejudice, A Story of Resilience, excerpts from the memoirs of Miss Chief Eagle Testicle, curated by Cree artist Kent Monkman. It's my honor to tour you through this exhibition, and there will be time for questions that you can ask at the end of this virtual tour. But I also want to make sure that you are aware that this exhibition is open to the public until January 3rd, 2021. So we hope if you are in the area that you come by and see it for yourself. This exhibition was actually created when Barbara Fisher, the director and CEO of the Art Gallery of the University of Toronto, invited Kent Monkman to respond to the Canada 150 celebrations that were being funded in 2015. This was at exactly the same time that the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission Calls to Action came out. And Kent Monkman, who's a Cree artist who lives in Toronto but was raised in Winnipeg, wanted to respond to the celebrations. From an Indigenous perspective, perhaps celebrating the creation of Canada was not the first, the first desire. So what he did was he was funded with Barbara Fisher. Um, they traveled across Canada to look at collections in museums across the country and to select historical objects to use in this exhibition and to tell the history of Canada's creation starting back 300 years ago in the 18th century with the founding of New France and then going all the way up to the present. Kent Monkman uses his alter ego Miss Chief Eagle Testicle, who he describes as a time-traveling, trickster, gender-bending, supernatural being. And you're going to see that this exhibition is laid out as excerpted chapters from Miss Chief's memoirs. So why don't we go in and start in the first chapter, New France, Reign of the Beaver. So I'm going to walk us through all nine chapters of this exhibition taken from the memoirs of Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. But first, I want to start on an overarching series of themes that you're going to be hearing about throughout the exhibition. The first is the theme of abundance and wealth and riches that are provided by these lands that are now known as Canada, but have been the ancestral home of indigenous peoples for thousands and thousands of years. So the first theme is the abundance, the plethora of resources, animal, flora, fauna that are available to us here on these lands. And then its opposition, the taking of these resources, the extraction of these resources, and the movement into poverty and starvation. And I will be talking about that in the second chapter. Another main theme is a theme of moving from illness or sickness into health and wellness. So from experiencing many of the traumas of colonialism, and that would include smallpox and influenza, all the way up to present day ills of tuberculosis and HIV, um, and then into resilience and healing, indigenous health and well-being. Another theme that you're going to see throughout this exhibition is spirituality, both Christian and indigenous spirituality. And you're going to see both of them playing out throughout the exhibition. So those three themes are very strong throughout. So keep your eye peeled for that. So we're starting in chapter one, New France, Reign of the Beaver. And what you see to my right is the first installation by Kent Monkman called Scent of a Beaver. And some of you might recognize what we're seeing is Miss Chief herself on a swing, wearing beautiful buckskin and beaver with embroidery from a very French uh, fashion, uh, moccasins beaded, between General Wolfe and General Montcalm. And this is 
a taking of a very well-known painting by Jean-Honoré Fragonard called The Swing, where a woman swings back and forth between her two suitors in Rococo, France. And so what Kent Monkman has done is he's replayed this, this painting as an installation between two generals, British general, General Wolfe and French general Montcalm, who fought on the Plains of Abraham in the 18th century to control the lands that would become Canada. And so this was a very famous battle where actually, even though technically the British won and ended up getting control of Canada, um, both of these generals died um, as a result of injuries on the Plains of Abraham. But what's most important here and what Kent Monkman wants us to know is that when the original fur traders came from France and from England to colonize, to extract resources such as beaver from these lands. Who was in charge? Well, actually, indigenous people were in charge. And so here, Miss Chief is talking about being wooed by both the French and the British for her favors. And being wooed because the fur trading industry was actually very much created by indigenous hunters. And so here on my left, you see a painting called The Massacre of Innocence. And Kent Monkman has used another very common theme in classical history representational painting to tell the story of a massacre. But instead of the expected um, Greek or Roman deaths that we see, what we're seeing, um, and I hope the cameras are zooming in, are indigenous and non-indigenous fur hunters killing beaver for their fur. And you might not know, but in the 18th century, not only was the beaver pelts, the inner pelts used to create these incredible hats in Europe, but also the castorium, the oil of the beaver was used to make perfume. And if you zoom in even closer, you'll see that Miss Chief is in the lower left corner and she's carrying a beaver, almost as if when you first look at it, it looks like she's suckling a baby, but actually she's carrying a, a beaver like her child. And Kent Monkman told us that in Cree, the word for beaver is actually means brethren. They're our family. And so Kent Monkman is making the point that while European fur traders came in under such companies as the Hudson Bay Company to extract as many resources as they could from the lands, indigenous people didn't think of the flora and the fauna as resources. They thought about them as family. And that's another theme that you're gonna see throughout this exhibition, that Miss Chief is all about family and love. So we're in the second. Okay, so we're taking a quick pause after chapter one. And we're gonna get, um, we're gonna get Rhea to bring up an image for us of scent of a beaver which is proudly displayed on our screens for those. So let's, um, I'm gonna just ask Steph quickly to, uh, first of all, define for us what the difference is between an installation and a painting. That may seem fairly obvious to people who can see them, but for those of us who may not be able to see, what, what's the difference between an installation and a painting? Well, I hope I don't have, to, I, I, a painting's pretty obvious, yes, it's uh, you know, something rendered on canvas and hung on the wall. And an installation is a, a, a usually, um, consists of a number of components that are assembled in the gallery. So in this case, we have, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a garden tableau that's created with three life-size figures. Um, as we've uh, heard from Jennifer, uh, Miss Chief on, on a swing that's covered in vines and roses, and the two generals on either side. Um, Wolf on uh, our left uh, is wearing a red uniform, the British, and Montcalm behind wearing the blue uniform of the French. And so sorry, one of, the, uh, sorry, one of the other details that um, uh, this in this in, and in this installation, the the swing is actually animated and it swings just gently back and forth as well. You're, you're going where my mind is going. Oh, and I, the, mm. the, uh, the swing seems to be me seems to me to be made out of some kind of vegetation. The, the ropes uh, that, that hold, that uh, Miss Chief is holding are entwined with vines, grapes, 
roses, you know, it's very lush. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering if you could just share with us a, a few of the details. Jennifer did a pretty good job of, of detailing Miss Chief's um, traditional dress here. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Because it was described sort of as a pelt and I just, I'm, I'm struggling to see what that pelt looks like. It's actually more of a dress of the time, a, a, a fancy dress of the time with bell sleeves and a um, snug bodice and a long skirt. Um, and uh, there's trim that's a sort of gold lace trim and embroidery. So the, the beaver that she talks about is that it's, it, they're, they're panels of fur along that sort of all edge work of, of beaver along the, the edge of the hem and the cuffs and down the front. And then there's also lace around the neck and inside the sleeves. So it's, it's, it's quite a, um, a modern, it would be a modern dress of the time, but with uh, uh, traditional sort of elements like as the embroidery and the, uh, the beaver. She's wearing and traditional moccasins um, as well. And her hair is actually done up in, in fancy curls and kind of a bouffant. And, and of course the, the generals, we've got General Wolfe, the English general and mm -hmm. General Montcalm from mm -hmm. the French side. Uh, you said British red, French blue. Uh, anything more about the details of their uniforms? Um, not so much, but one thing I wanted to mention was that all three figures have Kent Monkman's face. Ah. We, know that we know of course that Miss Chief does, but so do the generals. Okay. And they have where their eyes are blue, but otherwise their faces are the same. Their skin tone is also, they have a lighter, paler complexion as well. Right. Okay. All right. I'm going to welcome Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, sorry, Jennifer's in the virtual tour. I'm going to welcome Marie and Asaku to uh, unpack this just a little bit for us because, um, I, so here's a detail I did not know, which is that Monkman's face was in both generals as well, which uh, from my interpretation, French and English, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, would be considered non-Indigenous peoples. So what is Kent Monkman saying to us, or what do you interpret that he's saying to us about having his face on all three of these characters? Uh, well, I guess I'll take this one. Um, can everyone hear me? We yes. can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, so one of the reasons that Monkman says that he puts his face on many of the figures throughout the show, and it's not just this piece, is because he speaks about how um, traditionally in this type of painting or this type of artwork or this era, any representation of Indigenous people was fairly ubiquitous. It was just the same image over and over and over again of some you know, um, somebody who might be wearing a headdress and a loincloth and have a very, you know, stoic look on their face. So he's playing with that idea and you can see it throughout the show. How does that compare then with, uh, and, and Asaku, maybe I'll ask you for your interpretation of this. Cause again, I think my, my understanding of the installation in general is that he wants people to interpret things Yes. Uh, to experience things and to, and to get what they will. So now you've got a French general and an English general that both also have his face, but they're not they're not portrayed here as indigenous people. So now he's got again. I, I struggle to keep the to have the words for this, mm -hmm. but he has a white face. That's right. I'm going to follow up on uh, what Marie said just earlier. Um, Kent Monkman told us, uh, or he I've seen him speak about this that when he visited a Natural History Museum in New York some time ago. Uh, indigenous people's depiction or the mannequins for had all same head, regardless of their sex, age, or gender, they mm -hmm. were all one head placed on different, uh, different uh, belongings or clothing. But I think he's uh, pointing out that, that reversing the, uh, what you've done to showing us that they're not all one person, if right. that makes sense. That's so interesting to me and a detail I, I absolutely would have missed had it not been described to me. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna ask Rhea to pull up um, one of the, so image, uh, one of the images of Massacre of the Innocents. So 1.2, maybe Rhea, if you could pull that up. 
because we're going to just switch focus. This is a, a kind of a large overview. And again, Jennifer did a, quite a nice job of being able to explain to us um, the essence of this photo, which is uh, I, I, my interpretation of her description was that it's a group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people sort of fighting amongst themselves and uh, claiming beavers for, I guess Indigenous peoples are protecting beavers and um, the settlers are claiming them for their furs. Steph, can you give us sort of a, a, a wide overview of what this painting is all about? Um, sure, I'll do my best. It's a, it's a large painting and it's really dominated by the landscape. Like the top half of the canvas is really the sky and the clouds. And we're looking at a lush green river valley with rocky hills and distant mountains, golden sunlight and all of that. So in the foreground is where all this action is happening, sort of on a grassy knoll, just in the bottom, you know, fifth or quarter of the canvas. And uh, this, it's a battle raging between man and beaver here amidst uh, fallen trees and stumps. So there are 13 hunters and all of them are um, engaged one way or another uh, with uh, the, battling these beavers. So some of them have their rifles raised over their heads to bash the beaver. Others slash the beavers with long bloody knives. Some of them use their bare hands to choke them or hurl them on the ground. And the beavers' faces have expressions of terror. So the, some of them are mm. holding their paws up in self-defense. Some of them are looking at their attackers with pleading expressions. Some are caught in leg hole traps and some lay gashed and bleeding. So as Jennifer mentions, while all this carnage is going on, so mischief is tucked away, hidden away behind a tree in the left corner. And she's, uh, she appears nearly, she's nearly naked. She's um, you know, got her legs tucked underneath her and she's holding the beaver in her lap as, as Jennifer told us. So she's um, uh, you know, hidden away there in the shadows. And there are two other beavers cowering near her for protection. And it just, she looks so vulnerable there. And it just, it's, you know, you hate to think about what would happen if any of the hunters noticed her there, you know? So that's, that's mm. my nutshell view there. Anything else you want me to? Yeah. No, I think, I think that that's a great, a great overview of, of what, what we're witnessing here. Uh, one of the things that I, I find kind of an interesting juxtaposition and it's just sort of how it was explained to me and maybe we'll, maybe we'll throw this to Marie um, about uh, Monkman seems to have a lot of these um, like vast landscape kind of things as the big backdrop of, of the art pieces. And I wonder if there's any contrast, like what he's saying about like this, the beautiful land versus the carnage that's happening right up front. You got any thoughts around that, Maria? I do. Um, and if, if you, if you wouldn't mind, I might just take it back to um, kind of Please. deciphering what the image is about first. Um, yes, you were right. There is this kind of manifest destiny type imagery um, that happens in a lot of his work. And it is trying to show um, how, you know, people who would have made this artwork at the time that he's, um, he's commenting on saw the, the landscape that Indigenous people were li living on as something to be conquered, something to be owned, something that was valued outside of um, say what an indigenous person might call mother nature mm -hmm. or Turtle Island. Um, so we've got that imagery and that that is something that shows up, but I wanted to take it back to the people who are actually inflicting the pain on the beavers. And also um, Miss Chief who is sitting in the corner and she's holding a couple of beavers and she's holding them almost as if they're her children trying to protect them. Uh, I just want to read something from the manuscript that uh, comes along with um, this exhibit. And it is, it is fairly essential reading um, or essential listening. I'm not sure if there is an auditory version out there, but it's something to think about if um, there isn't one. Um, but in this particular painting, he's not just speaking of colonial violence against um, the beaver. Um, he's also talking about how um, indigenous people are also implicit in this. They are they they contributed to this violence. Mm -hmm. So um, in this in the book, it, it it lays things out by chapter. So I'll just read this one quote. 
No one got rich or powerful without us on their side. We always embraced new technologies. The guns worked well and we printed ourselves and we prided ourselves on new ways of thinking. Why not humor those handsome Jesuit priests? There were far too few to cause much confusion. So at this time, it, when what I believe he may be commenting on is the fact that um, it, it wasn't just settlers, it was indigenous people who were um, also profiting and benefiting off of this trade and potentially not realizing what was actually coming along. Miss Chief, on the other hand, being a trickster and also somebody who's able to be a bit of a fly on the wall, does see impending doom. That's right. how there, there are multiple interpretations. And I, I think that Kent would say himself that he leaves things open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that's so exquisite about Kent's work is that um, he leaves room for that. Uh, for people to, to view it from different perspectives and different angles. Uh, Asaku, what's your perspective of this? Because uh, again, you're another set of eyes looking at this piece. So what, what perspective do you bring? Again, I completely in agree with, with Marie. And I just want to highlight or reiterate that fact that uh, North America was sold to as empty land, as if nobody was lived. Mm -hmm. And that's how settlers thought of it. So it's easier to expand their um, uh, colonial um, policies on the empty land they, they were claiming, yet it wasn't true. There were indigenous people living there. I think that's a very strong statement of Kent Monkman. That's how you depict it, but that wasn't true. So he's, right. uh, Kent Monkman is stating that your understanding of this empty land up for grab is not true, is I think what he's trying to tell us. I love that. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, we could we could spend hours on each of these installations and paintings and I recognize that. So we're gonna showcase chapter two, I think, and move to chapter two, uh, which is starvation. And there's two works in this chapter. So Rick, will you play chapter two for us? So we're in the second chapter and it is called starvation. And so here you're seeing the movement historically from 18th century in what the Europeans called the new world, which they considered a wilderness, empty and ripe for extracting resources, for becoming wealthy. But then you're seeing the results of that way of thinking and you're seeing it in chapter two, starvation. And Ken Monkman is basically explaining what happened when settlers, when the British started claiming the lands and started moving west. The main installation in this chapter is called the Starvation Table. This was created by Kent Monkman. And here what you're seeing, if you look up close, is you're seeing a beautiful table, like fancy mahogany with lace laid out with Canadian um, silverware, brass candlesticks, candelabras, um, champagne in the glasses, salmon and other delicious foods, grapes, and you're seeing the bounty of the land as the Europeans thought about the new world, ready to make them wealthy. And as they pushed west, the idea was that modernity was going to bring them resources. And so as this table moves, it goes from a lot of this beautiful um, tableware, which Kent Monkman selected from places like the Canadian Museum of History or the Glenbow Museum. And it moves on to the end where what you see are empty plates only filled with buffalo or bison bones. And this signifies the fact that the riches that were planned by the settlers when they settled this land were not um, shared with the indigenous people of this land. So this painting that represents this idea that Kent Monkman is trying to get across is called the Iron Horse. And as you can see, it's a play on the story of the Trojan horse um, of Troy. Um, and what you're seeing are indigenous people pulling in an iron horse along a new railroad that's being laid. And the railroad for Kent Monkman symbolizes and for the settlers as well, symbolize this idea of moving into modernity and all the riches and wealth 
that the modern world was going to offer the settlers. But this is a Trojan horse because the story is actually one of famine and being incarcerated onto reserves and being put into Indian residential schools. And so as we walk to the end, you see Kent Monkman has created plates which have transfers of archival images of the piles of bison bones that were shot by settlers to the point where indigenous people starved to death because being put onto reserves and not having access to their main food on the plains caused them to starve, to put it bluntly. So here we are on the end of the starvation table installation. And we've moved from these valued museum objects, uh, treasures that feed the European settlers. And we've moved to these plates, which Kent Monkman has called the starvation plates and also the resilience plate. But on these plates are archival photographs taken in the 19th century of piles of bison bones. And basically, the buffalo or the bison were decimated. Sometimes they were even shot by this kind of rifle out of the window of railroads, of, of railroad trains. Um, and what this caused was a huge famine for indigenous people on the plains. And it forced them into a position of basically needing to give up their, their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, because they were starving. And you're going to see this theme played out, this forcible incarceration onto reserves, onto Indian residential schools, and eventually, as in nowadays, into prisons. The other um, theme that Kent Monkman is commenting on is Western painters such as George Catlin or Paul Kane, who envisioned the West, this place of new opportunity for Europeans or Euro-Canadians, um, as a place where the Indian was disappearing was vanishing, was not able to keep up with modernity. And he very much wants to undermine this stereotype. And so what you're going to see, he's taken some, some prints and some paintings of people like George Catlin at the end, this image of buffalo dance on the plains. And you're going to see him showing it incorporated throughout the exhibit to show that really indigenous people are resilient. They did not disappear. And they certainly were not the vanishing Indian who couldn't live in modern times. OK, that was uh, the second chapter, which uh, is known as starvation. So there's two works in this particular chapter that we just want to get into a little bit deeper. So again, you know, Jennifer's done a really admirable job. I didn't actually catch the first time that I watch this virtual tour, that this table was an installation and it was as grand as it as it is. So I'd like to just invite Steph back to give us kind of an overview of some of the, that, that sounds funny, it's an overview of the details, haha, <laughs> uh, but an overview of what we're looking at and what we're experiencing with the, the this vast sort of table setup. Thanks, Amy. So the image on the screen right now it shows the table from the um, from the starvation end, uh, and I, my description will begin from the other, the opposite end, the bountiful end. I mean, the table itself is about 18 feet long, which kind of and it is about it's divided, I would say, into maybe six foot sections. So the bountiful end. The surface of the table is that polished mahogany that Jennifer mentioned, and the legs underneath are these delicately carved legs. And on top is, is the surface is barely visible because it's so loaded with food and champagne and candelabras. And the next section of the table, the wood lightens up somewhat. It's still smooth, and the legs are square, but they're 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 tapered and not, but they're not carved. And this section also has food and sterling silver candles cigar boxes and the plates are you know kind of commemorative centennial plates and, and that kind of thing and these first two sections are also covered by clear plexiglass as if they're under a display case so then we move to the final section of the of the table and the table is is uniform so the table itself is not divided except by these um, plexiglass uh, display covers and the differences in in the the surface so the final end 
just ends in rough wooden planks. The legs are made of raw two by fours. There's no cover. And the lacy cloth that has run the entire length of the table kind of disintegrates at this end into a scattering of small animal bones. And mm -hmm. then the plates that Jennifer, the starvation plates that Jennifer talked about are placed around, so there are seven of them placed around the edge of this end of the table. And as she mentions, the images on those plates are of the bison bones that have been stacked by settlers in mounds more than eight feet high, just extending in all directions. Oh, that's a that's a really uh, good image. Thank you, Ria, for bringing that up. So I, you know, the first again, the first time that I experienced this as part of this tour, it was a little bit lost on me that these that each of these seven plates has a different image of a photograph, an old photograph on it. That's the the pile of these these bones because I actually uh, interpreted the bones as actually being literal bones on the plate, but there's an aspect of both here, right? There are both literal bones and images of bones. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. There, uh, there, there's a scattering of bones on the table as if the, as if the, as if the lace is disintegrated and these bones are on the table. Mm -hmm. And then there are some actual small animal bones on some of the plates as well, in addition to the image. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Steph. I appreciate that. Um, I also missed the first time around the, the difference in the, the table textures um, from like opulent all the way down to like simple and hardy and of the earth kind of. Um, I, and I, I love that imagery and I, it's saying something really powerful. And I know Marie is going to tell me what this is saying because there are lots of complex themes kind of happening here and uh, you're armed with the tools to be able to walk us through that. Um, okay, so once again, I, I definitely can't speak for Monkman, but what I can tell you what I see. Yeah. And um, first, I just want to say being part of this is actually really wonderful because with hearing other people's um, descriptions of this object specifically, mm -hmm. I'm starting to realize that there are parts of it that I didn't even understand were there. I saw them, but I didn't acknowledge them. So for instance, when we were looking at the larger image or, or just the, the fallback image of this table, um, it was pointed out that there was a glass case around it. I can't tell you how many times I've been into this room and seen that glass case and then it just disappears at the end of the table. Mm -hmm. And for me, it just seemed to make sense, but I didn't pick it apart in that way. And now that other end of the table that is more opulent has a completely different meaning to me. What it is, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but just to say, that's that's a really interesting interesting thing to point out. And it just goes to show that this show is so detailed and it's so finessed that you can't just go through it once. So um, back to your question, Amy. Sorry, I always divert and go. I love it. That's what you're here for. <laughs> Remember, um, we're, we're witnessing this through your experience as well. And it's of total value um, right. to get all these different perspectives. Right. And I would say Isaku has an incredible eye for these things as well. So I, I'm really curious to hear what he has to say. But Ria, if you wouldn't mind going back to the other close up of the um, end of the table, please. Um, so the starvation plates here, what I'm seeing is yes, as Steph said, the lace, the opulence, the luxury is starting to disappear and it's turning into bones. And so when I saw these plates, if you zoom really close in on them, there's photographs of piles of hundreds of thousands of buffalo skulls that are piled up along the railroads. And um, this, again, um, in, in um, his manuscript that goes along with the show, he talks about, Miss Cheat specifically, sorry, she talks about um, witnessing how um, at first, they looked at these piles of bones and they saw, you know, just how wasteful and they were disgusted at how wasteful these people were. And then they realized what they were doing. What they were doing was intentionally killing off the buffalo to starve them to death because they realized how much they needed these animals. And today we still have very few buffalo left because they were so successful. But when you look at the image itself and you see, and I see the strewed bones all over the table, I think of what's left at the opulent side, what um, you know the settlers left indigenous people when mm. they took their 
land when they- The scraps on the tables. And they left them scraps on the table. They left them nothing that could actually feed them. And that goes into other parts of um, the show later on where he talks about incarceration and what's happened through intergenerational trauma that goes really all the way back to this um, like historic violence against the animals and thus the um, the original people of this territory, this land. That's, that's an interesting perspective, Marie. And I, I just wanna touch on that because uh, when we're talking about this lace disintegrating into the bone, and then we talk about buffalo bones, my mind goes to, okay, a buffalo is a very large animal. So how, like there must be very large bones on this table, but they're not. They're small, delicate um, par- bones, almost, I, I don't know, I would say like like the size of chicken bones, they feel like to me. Um, so they're small. And so again, when you talk about the scraps being left on the table after the bounty, you couldn't possibly feed people off of this kind of scrap, right? Um, well, I, Asaku- I, I, I sorry, go it, ahead. Sorry, it may be um, muskrat bones. Um, Maybe. I have one of these skulls that's similar, actually. And it, it may just, you know, pontificating, it may be what Indigenous people were left to eat, you know? Ah, Who knows? interesting. Who knows what was yeah. left. Thank you for that. Asaku, what is it that, that this yeah. image conjures up for you? Thank you. I think the details are covered, but my main point from this piece was the progression of this colonial extraction economy's impact on Indigenous people. Before the colonization, Indigenous people have plenty of everything. Mm-hmm. So that's the beginning of the uh, time of plenty. Now this is the progression. So yes, detail is important, but the impact of this at the beginning, perhaps it was a gradual beginning, mm-hmm. but within that span of that table, uh, people are, were starving. And then I think that colon- colonial economy uh, is still ongoing, is what uh, what I take from uh, this piece. Thank Agreed. You. Thank you very for that. The very powerful stuff. Um, okay, uh, we're going to move on to chapter three, which is the Fathers of Confederation. So I'm going to ask Rick to play this video and we'll come back and um, unpack chapter three after this. Chapter three is called the Fathers of Confederation. And behind me, what you can see is the iconic image of this exhibition. It's called the Daddies. Basically, it was inspired by the meeting of the Fathers of Confederation, where they founded, where they first floated and founded the idea of Canada becoming Canada in Charlottetown in PEI in 1864. And there's a classic Robert Harris painting that was painted to represent all of the founding fathers in PEI. What you see behind me is Kent Monkman's redoing of this classic painting of the founding of fathers. And what he's done is he's placed Miss Eagle, Miss Chief Eagle testicle into the center of the painting. And to those of you that know the original painting, there actually is a stool right in the middle where Miss Chief is, has been put by Kent Monkman. And Kent said, this is ridiculous. How can these Euro, soon to be Euro Canadian settlers found this nation without including the indigenous people of these lands who have governed these lands for generations and generations. So he's inserted Miss Chief naked, except for her Laboutin high heels, sitting on a Hudson Bay Company blanket on top of a Chateau Miss Chief um, wine case facing the shocked and titillated eyes of the Fathers of Confederation. And one of the things you'll notice is that throughout this exhibition, Kent Monkman has an entire studio that he works with, studio of painters. And so he started a new way of creating these monumental history paintings that are representational. He very much uses real portraits of real people. So for this painting, he actually did research and each of the faces represents individuals who were at this moment for the founding of Miss Chief, uh, for the, excuse me, for the founding of Canada. And then inserting Miss Chief naked 
and calling it the daddies. Of course, the daddies are either um, your sugar daddies that, that give you funding to keep your lifestyle, or they're maybe your pimps. Um, so he's talking about this relationship, and he's using another theme that you're going to see throughout this exhibition is mischief sexuality and indigenous sexuality, and a sexuality that is not uh, binary, that doesn't have to be male or female. And Kent Monkman is very much playing on the strength of this sexuality to speak back to what he sees as a very patriarchal, um, male-dominated Christian way of thinking that is the founding of Canada. So here, Miss Chief, whether she's showing her junk or her beaver to the fathers of Confederation, she's doing her best to unsettle them. Okay. That's the end of chapter three. And I, Steph, I'm going to welcome you back in for this portrait of the daddies. Um, Jennifer did a really great job at giving us um, some of the details, the Hudson's Bay blanket, these classic high heels, the fact that Miss Chief is naked. Um, can you sort of set the larger scene for us? I mean, like how many people are in this room? What kind of atmosphere is this? This is, a, I think, a fairly faithful reproduction of, of, of the original uh, painting done of the Fathers of Confederation. So I believe it's in uh, the a chamber of the old Quebec Parliament building, and it's a very it's a very wide horizontal painting. It's uh, about nine and a half feet wide and five feet high, and there are thirty seven men, Fathers of Confederation, in this room. And Sir John A. Macdonald stands in the center of the painting. There are three big windows at the back of the uh, of the back of the room that look out onto the St. Lawrence River, and he's standing, you know, right in the center, and he's surrounded by you know thirty six other men. Most of them are sitting around tables. There are bottles of champagne and glasses of champagne, and some of them are holding documents, but all of their eyes are on Miss Chief, and she, you know, she sort of has lifted one hand in the air as if to say, "Here I am. Look at me." You know, nothing to hide, nothing to be ashamed of. You know, it's a very confident um, pose. And I love how the image that we get, although we know that Miss Chief is, is nude, we're seeing the backside uh, of, of Miss Chief. So like Jennifer says, whether Miss Chief is showing them her, her junk or her beaver, <laughs> we don't actually know. And I think that's part of the whole um, uh, the fluidness around um, the, the gender bending trickster, right? Uh, is that that's never quite revealed to us. It's, it's not necessary to be revealed. Um, Marie, I know that, that you have a, a, um, some thoughts about this and I certainly saw Asaku's piece with June when he talked about this. So I'm gonna, we're gonna unpack some of that after Asaku. So Marie, what, this seems like such a, I mean, this is such a like a an iconic colonial view of the founding of Canada. And what is Miss Chief saying by being witness to this time? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I've got a puppy, a puppy crying in the background. I didn't Aww. want you to have to deal with that. Um, so I'm just gonna quote Monkman again. Um, one thing before I do one thing I'll point out that you can't see from this picture Rhea I'm not sure if we have a close up of any of the eyes of these characters, these founding fathers, um, the daddies, if you will, but they're bloodshot they're extremely red and they have the these these looks in their eyes that seem fairly disturbed um, they uh, we're not entirely sure what they're thinking, but they're gobsmacked. Um, they're all sitting around having a drink, um, just as you see in the, uh, the original portrait of the founding fathers. Um, but in this one, we see uh, Miss Chief, as you've said, sitting on a Hudson Bay blanket and seeming to hold court, seeming to have some kind of, of authority in the room. And so I'll just read what um, Monkman says in chapter two, Fathers of Confederation. When the stakes are high and our enemies mighty, it behooves us to do what we can in order to tip the scales in our favor. My people need an ally in power, and I had my ways of getting a seat at the table. Men are so simple, blinded by greed. They see only that from which they think they can profit. I give them what they want. They believe that they take it from me. 
it amuses me to play, play them like pawns. Naked, I am at my strongest. Now I'll turn it over to Asaku. Great. Asaku, you've got a, a, a very, I, 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 I'm just going to let you speak, Asaku. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I loved your, your experience of this the first yeah. time I heard it. This painting, to me, this is all about power. So the base, base or the inspiration of this painting was called the, uh, uh, the Fathers of Confederations. Those are in, in this painting, Suda. These are powerful, rich, uh, straight, most likely, maybe not all of them, but those are powerful figures. And now in this painting, Kent Monkman's called, calling them daddies. So it's a little bit diminished, I think. And uh, in the original paintings, there was nobody more powerful in that picture, but here she is showing up naked. And she's not, um, as it's been said earlier, not being shy. I think she's interjecting her in self into the history making. She's not just showing up in front of old men, but intervening into the history. And um, just in case some of you may not know what daddies are in gay culture context, I think it's similar in straight, but uh, so in gay culture, there are often um, older men who like to be in, in relationship with younger men, or perhaps somebody who'd like to uh, play uh, role play and the part of a uh, father figure. Again, that's the power play, who's, mm -hmm. who's in charge, who's dominant. But here, I think Kent Monkham is calling them daddy and uh, Miss Chief is in power. She's preaching to the daddies. I, I love, I, thank you for that. I, I love that piece. Um, I wonder if, and I, this is me going out on a crazy limb here, um, might this be, you know, I, 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 I recall Miss Chief, you know, being described as, as uh, almost a supernatural figure. And maybe this is a little bit like, I was there the whole time and you think you orchestrated this, but I was actually there the whole time. Um, and that's kind of, it gives me goosebumps actually to even think about it, that while, you know, settlers and colonials thought that they were in charge, that that maybe wasn't really the case, you know, and Miss Chief is trying to, sh to share that with us. I agree with that, yes. She shows up in many different points in, hi in the history uh, in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she's just witnessing events. Sometimes she's interjecting herself. Uh, Kent Monkman told us that sometimes she's not in uh, Miss Chief's figure. She's uh, shape-shifting too. So she mm -hmm. could be a bird in some of the paintings. Oh, I'm sure you'll make sure you point that out to us when that happens. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to, I, I know time's flying really fast folks and, and I uh, would love to move on to chapter four, which is the forcible transfer of children. Uh, so Rick, will you please play chapter four for us? This next section, of this exhibition I think is the most difficult. It's called the forcible transfer of children. And what you see behind me is probably Kent Monkman's most powerful painting in this exhibition. And it's called The Scream. And it's about the taking of indigenous children to Indian residential schools. Kent Monkman felt in doing this exhibition, that the history of the colonial violence perpetuated on indigenous bodies, on children, on women, on men, on non-binary spirits, are not represented in the museums in Canada. And how can this important history be ignored or not taught? So the scream, I believe is the largest painting in this exhibition. So big, it can't be hidden away about what happened. And what you also see on the walls, the walls are painted black, and what you see on either side are cradle boards that were used by indigenous people, many different cultures, different forms, to carry their children, their babies, on their backs. And many of these cradle boards are, well, all the cradle boards are empty, 
but there are also images that look like tombstones and images that look like chalk outlines, like a police murder scene. Basically making the point visually that so many thousands of children went to residential schools and thousands did never came back home again. So this is really the most difficult chapter and one of the things I haven't pointed out is that the excerpts of the memoirs of Miss Chief are the main labels for each of the chapters and you can buy these, these excerpted uh, memoirs but also they're the labels and this label which is printed on our walls in English, French, and Cree syllabics, Miss Chief just says, this is the one I cannot talk about. The pain is too deep. We were never the same. And I'll just leave this chapter at that. Okay, so the hair is rising on my forearms like you wouldn't believe. Um, Steph, I'm going to bring you in to just describe some of the details of this particular painting. Um, I, I think I think I'll just leave it to you to describe them, Steph. Um, the sort of the, the the overview of this. Who who are the characters in this painting? Because I see some what I think are Mounties, but if you can unpack that for me visually, I would appreciate that. Yeah. So this is um this is a rural scene, and uh, there's in the background a large shabby sort of house with tattered curtains and a patched roof, dark clouds over the house. And in the large patchy yard, there are seven Mounties, two priests, two nuns, pulling children away from three indigenous women. So there's seven children, most of them toddlers. The, um, the Mounties are wearing the traditional red serge jackets with black pants and the yellow stripe down the side. Then the Jesuit priests are also in full black robes with crosses swinging from their necks. And the nuns are in full black habits with the white wimple and veil. The, the women, uh, so the indigenous women are wearing blues, greens, purples, and they are struggling to uh, hang on to their children. At the center of the painting is, is one mother who is lunging almost horizontally, screaming. If she could leap out of this painting, she would. Her face is anguished, her mouth is open as if screaming, and her arms are desperately reaching for the child who's being carried away by one of the priests. Two Mounties are holding her back. One is roughly grabbing her dress and her hair, and the other grabbing her by the arm and shoulder. And of course the Mounties are wearing, you know, leather gloves and they have leather boots. It's very harsh uh, to say the least. Um, in other parts of the um, scene there, the, a child has fallen and lies in the dirt at the Mounties feet. Another mother is kneeling, clutching her young daughter while a nun and a Mountie try to pry her away. And a third mother pulls her daughter close as another priest seizes the girl's arm and leg, yanking her. Over this whole scene on the right side of the canvas, there's a Mountie standing guard with a rifle and another chasing a young boy. Near the house, there's a German shepherd that's barking viciously at, another, at a nun who is holding a struggling, squirming child and another Mountie carrying a girl. The last Mountie stands on the porch of the house and he's pointing at something perhaps in the direction of three young teens. They're running off into the distance, into the fields beyond, and an eagle soars above them. And there is some blue sky on that horizon. Oh, it's pretty intense. Um, sorry, Marie, um, maybe you can, I I'm sure that you have witnessed this image a thousand times, uh, having been in its space so frequently. T tell me what it is that you you experience when you see something like this. I know how it's making me feel. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to. I would love to know how you feel about it. Um, I think everybody has different kinds of reactions to it, and one of the reasons that it is such a strong image is because it's it's taking a reality uh, that was happening for generation after generation after generation. Um, silently for some and for others just um, violently real and in their face. Um, 
and it compiles it all into one image. And this is kind of the crux that painters face when they're trying to tell a story that lasts so long, is that it, they, um, painters jam pack um, moments of, of this particular one, moments of terror and anguish um, that lasted for decades into a single image. And so what I witness when I see this is um, the destruction of a culture. This is the dismantling of a people. And of course, nuns didn't show up in their habits and priests and their robes. Mounties were probably not um, wearing their red jackets. Um, as they're depicted in this image, they would have come a little bit more subtly because obviously what would happen if somebody takes their children is not peaceable, um, not always anyway. Um, so when I see this image, I think of the indigenous people that I know who have responded to it by saying, I see my auntie, I see my grandmother, I see, um, I see what's happened to my people and uh, the ripple effects of that. Asaku, what about you? What does this, this painting evoke for you? Um, I think this is the most important Kent Monk, Monkman's work to date. Uh, most powerful, most challenging. Um, this is the um, state and church sanctioned cultural genocide in action. Mm -hmm. uh, yet this was not shown to us like this. This was Kate Monkman saying this happened mm -hmm. and this has never been in the galleries. Their voices were not there. And um, what I what I notice in this paintings are mothers, children screaming. The title is the scream. But then, when I stay in front of it for a while, the painting itself is screaming at us. Not the individuals, yes, they are too. But the painting itself is screaming at us to recognize the pain to recognize the history. Yeah. Yeah. Thank very, you. Very strong. And I think, again, I'm going out on a limb here because um, I think it's one of the things we're being asked to recognize as settlers yes. is, is to, to recognize that, that these atrocities happened, that this genocide happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this it profound this profoundly affects me but i also wonder about if there's any relationship between this particular painting and um the massacre of innocence which it was uh with the beavers and the terror on the faces of the beavers and if there's any relationships any relationship that you can see or make between these two concepts marie any thoughts on that well, I think that's a very astute observation, Amy. Um, oh my gosh! I, no, really, I oh hadn't, hadn't made that connection, but I, I, I think that there is a bit of an echo there, and um, it's not uncommon for for artists to have, you know, like a favorite way of um, showing an idea and mm -hmm. and showing that idea in a lot of different forms over and over again as they work through the process, right? So. Right. Monkman um, uses that um, tableau imagery that we hear Jennifer talk about. And uh, another thing for the audience to know is that the way that he gets these incredible um, lifelike animated, like horrifying faces on these people is to have real people set up in a studio with lights and he photographs them and then he projects them onto mm. these larger, these very large canvases that are more mural-like than anything. Um, and uh, these are actors and actresses or actors um, enacting this history, which is why you get such a strong feeling. I'm not like in, 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 um, in the painting that we looked at before where the beavers are being ravaged, I'm not sure if that technique was used, but certainly the same kind of choreography that we're seeing um, with the people is, is obvious now that you pointed out. Uh, okay, hey. thank you, Fran. 
sorry to interrupt, but I just, yeah. there's just a couple of, there's so much going on in this painting, but there are just, an, there's another important detail that I just don't want to uh, let Please. go by. In the grass, they're partially obscured by all of this other action, but there are what appear to be the, the bodies of two indigenous men lying unconscious in the grass. And I think that's, those are important. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so the, the fathers or the, the husbands or the uncles or the grandfather, the protecting the males and the massacre there. of the men and the protecting the of their children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a power. That's a powerful thing. Thank you, Steph, for, for bringing that to the forefront. Um, okay. Again, I say this every time I, we could unpack this all day long because there's so much richness in these paintings to witness. Um, but we, we have to move on to chapter five which is Wards of the State. So we'll let Rick play us chapter five. The next chapter is called Wards of the State, the Indian Problem. And this basically documents all of the legalities that the Canadian government passed in order to virtually incarcerate Indigenous peoples, so the Indian Act that made Indigenous people officially Indians and therefore the wards of the government of Canada, put them onto reserves, put their children into residential schools, and often um, ended up with incarceration of Indigenous bodies in prisons. What you see behind me is actually, I think, my personal favorite painting. It's called A Country Wife. And I hadn't realized this before I heard this from Kent Monkman, but a country wife is actually the term that a fur trader settler would use to describe his indigenous wife that he took when he came here from Britain. And then when his European wife showed up or when he decided to marry a European British woman, he would just dump his country wife. Um, so it really explains the violence of how indigenous people, how their lands were both embraced and then thrown away. And what you're seeing behind me is Miss Chief dressed up, and I don't know if you've got this reference, the title of the exhibition is Shame and Prejudice. And this is a reference to Elizabeth Bennett in the book Pride and Prejudice, which is a story that a novel that Kent Monkman really loves. And of course you're seeing, the, the phrase is, if a man has a, uh, a, big, a big inheritance, he's gonna be in need of a wife. But what you're seeing is Miss Chief wanting to marry Sir John A. MacDonald. And her mascara is running because of course he's already married. And of course he treats her abominably. But you're, getting at this very personal, very familial, you're getting at mischief wanting to be loved and wanting to be in partnership with the peoples that have come into her home and into her land. So I think that's a very powerful exhibit, a very powerful painting in the exhibit. The painting on my left, also in this chapter, is called The Subjugation of Truth. And what I love about this painting, it, doesn't, it never existed as a history painting a Canadian history painting. But what it um, is putting into a historical memory for Canada is the signing of Reser Treaty 6 in Manitoba with Chief Poundmaker and Chief Big Bear and the country of Canada. And above them, you see what should be uh, Queen Victoria, but of course, what it is, if you look up close, is Miss Chief dressed up as Queen Victoria, or even Kent Monkman as Miss Chief dressed up as Queen Victoria. And so you're getting what this entire exhibit is about, which is returning the colonial gaze, turning back the vision that Euro-Canadian settlers have, had and have of indigenous peoples as maybe part of the wilderness or dying out or from the past or lacking power and control. And he's changing that image around. And now he's Queen Victoria, the ultimate, the ultimate queen of the situation. But he's also depicting these real life um, chiefs, leaders, 
of people from the plains who were basically forced to sign treaty because their people were starving. And not only that, um, at the time that this was signed, both Poundmaker and Big Bear had been incarcerated in Mount Stoney Penitentiary for being part of what was known then as the Real Rebellion, so the Métis Rebellion that tried to take back the lands in Manitoba for indigenous people. And what I find especially empowering about this painting, and if you come to the exhibit, you'll see there's photographs of Poundmaker and Big Bear in prison, and you'll also see Poundmaker's moccasins, evidence of his real life, that he was there to protect his people, is that in, I believe it was 2016, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau exonerated Poundmaker and Big Bear and said that they were not treasonous for resisting Canada, that they were actually peaceful leaders defending their people. And I think that's really important that we're starting to re-see this, this history. Okay, I'm gonna take a closer look here at chapter five, Wards of the State. Uh, there's two paintings in here, but I, I kind of want to focus on the subjugation of truth um, because, uh, so, Ria, if you could bring up, yeah, thank you, the subjugation of truth, um, not because I'm putting any more importance on one over the other, um, but this one could use a little more description uh, in terms of the elements. So, Steph, could you um, uh, up here and um, give us, uh, set the scene of this one for us, because um, I kind of understand the history behind it, but I don't know the setting of the scene and who's there. Right, I'm not sure either. It looks like another parliament building room because we've got a, a window that's shaped very much like the one that was in the father's and in, in the daddy's painting. Right. So there's a there's a, a desk, you know, with intricate carving, and there's five uh, white men behind it, and they're uh, gesturing with pens and documents. One of them is a priest, and one of them is Sir Johnny Macdonald, and he's holding a champagne glass and kind of looking off in the other direction. The other person in the in the painting is on the on the left. There is a mounty in the red surge, and he's holding the shoulder of I is it Poundmaker on um, on the left, holding his shoulder. Both of the chiefs' uh, feet are shackled. Uh, they're sitting in chairs in front of the desk. They're facing each other, so we're looking at them in profile. Their um, their ankles are are shackled, and they're both wearing beaded moccasins and they're uh, wrapped in blank, uh, sort of blankets uh, behind them in the chairs. And, uh, and um, one of them is a Hudson Bay blanket. And the, um, I can just, uh, the, the portrait of Queen Victoria is on the back wall in a big fancy gilt, gold gilt frame. So it's a uh, Queen Victoria sort of from the thighs up. She wore you know, kind of a big blue satin dress and lace and, and Kent Monkman's face with the, the crown and the, and the white lacy veil. He's holding a scepter and it's quite subtle, but um, he's holding it in such a way that the, the fingers of his, of his hand, he's holding the hilt of the, of the scepter for the end, end of the scepter. And he's sort of tucked all of his fingers up except the middle one mm. <laughs> just resting on the scepter. And uh, so a little bit of a subtle detail there. Just a, just a little subtle. <laughs> I, I love it though. Again, a detail I would never have been able to pull out without the description. So thank you for that. Um, Maria, I'm going to turn it over to you first because um, I, I know that you've got this memoir that you're feverishly going through. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I love that. I love that. Um, tell us a little bit about this painting from your experience and if you've got some words from Kent Monkman there that unpack this a little bit for us. Um, okay, yeah, so from my experience, uh, the thing that stood out for me the most um, was just uh, the detail of the moccasins. Um, the story is unlike the painting of the daddy is it, it isn't part of history. This is a moment that did happen, but he kind of made up what he, rem he would uh, have imagined happening in a moment. And he has painted the moccasins on the feet um, of Poundmaker and it's and Big Bear. And it is um, a moment where you're seeing the two indigenous people who have now been taken hostage um, uh, 
staring at one another with these grave faces and all of the men around them seem to be a bit uh, like congratulating themselves, feeling very empowered and emboldened. And I will just read one thing um, about this particular section that I think is uh, suitable. Um, they wanted to take the Indian out of us. They couldn't do that, but they did beat our spirits. Generation after generation of us spent our childhoods in the residential schools being told over and over again that we were inferior until we believed it ourselves. And one of the ways that Canada did that to this population of incredible human beings was by taking their leaders and putting them in jail. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the way that it's gone throughout the entire world. If you take somebody that people respect and look to for guidance and you make them um, basically a slave to what you want them to do, then you have a means of controlling the rest of the population. Right. Asaku. Yes. What's your, what's your filter on this? What's your lens? Yes. Uh, Kent Monkman told us that this was um, low point in Cree, Cree nation's history because these uh, two men were admired, respected, and powerful figures. Mm -hmm and um, settler colonizers um, them. So I think Kent Monkman is giving us this, this so well planned, so well um, sy systematically uh, oppressing indigenous people. It's not just, they weren't just, you know, going one by one, not thinking. They, it was so well planned. Mm -hmm. It's uh, this is part of psychological warfare, right? Um, I think these uh, capturing the admired, respected leaders. Right. And uh, yeah, it is, um, yes, very sad moment, I think. And then, then um, Miss Chief as a witness. As a witness. As a, as a Queen Victoria figure. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, my question to Kent Monkman would be, what are you thinking in that picture? Are you going to do something? Mm. Are you going to show up here, rescue somebody? Is my, you know, <laughs> emotional reaction to this? Because I feel uh, Miss Chief as a superhero that mm -hmm. I look up to. So are you going to come out now and do something? Is how I experience this, this paintings. Oh, I, I love that perspective. Thank you for sharing it. Um, I was going to wait till the end, but I, I'm now for, I'm now worried I'm going to forget to ask this because my brain is so full of things that I want to ask. Um, so I'm going to just take the opportunity now because again, we see the Hudson's Bay blanket again. This is a, you know at the top of the, the introduction, Steph mentioned to us the reappearing image of the Hudson's Bay blanket. Marie, maybe you can unpack what the theme is around the Hudson's Bay black, ba blanket and, and why it tends to reappear so frequently. Your thoughts on that? When you unmute yourself, my friend. <laughs> Sorry about that. Once okay. again, struggling animal in the hallway. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can't say for sure, but um, I, I feel as if it may have some representation, not only with um, just how important blankets were to indigenous people, and they still have blanketing ceremonies today, um, which a, a lot, like basically um, recognizes a person's um, graduation, if you will, from one part of their life to the next. It is not a small ceremony. It's an incredible ceremony. Um, so blankets were extremely important, um, not only for practical reasons, keeping you alive in, in the harsh winters, um, but also for great honor. Um, and um, to, to see uh, both of these honorable people um, sitting with their blankets, uh, you know, skewed, kind of like noting who they are as um, these prestigious people. Um, but also there may be some kind of a reference to what happened with blankets and, and how that, that, that 
cultural, iconic, beautiful thing that was part of indigenous culture from coast to coast um, was uh, used as a weapon of war um, when settlers decided that they were going to give, give basically these people who did not have the immune systems that we did um, severe diseases that wiped out huge, huge populations of people. Um, it's, it's just a, a guess, but that could be it. I, I did hear, I think it was uh, in the Q&A that, that Jennifer did, uh, Jennifer Kramer did with Kent Monkman, mm -hmm. where they talk about the reference to, and I want to say it was smallpox, the, to the blankets being sort of um, infected with smallpox and then given to people. Yeah, um, and it happened all over uh, North America. It wasn't just a Canadian thing. That was, that was a shared, um, that was a shared tool across when North I, America. When I heard that piece of history, it's so devastating to me that I had a hard time comprehending it, that that one human being could do that to another human being. I, I, it, 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 it's incomprehensible to me. And to, um, give, to, to give you just a little uh, hint about the populations that we lost in Haida Gwaii, a very small island um, up north, um, mm -hmm. you can actually see um, you can see beautiful things from that area, but they, they lost almost 80% of their population due to smallpox specifically. Right. Um, they had to leave uh, their traditional sites and move to other areas because they lost so many people. Um, and if you can imagine losing 80% of the population of the people that we have in Canada right now, um, just how devastating that would be all of the all of the histories that would be lost yeah absolutely um okay with One that my friends said about the uh house Bay company blanket absolutely exactly uh, said it was uh of, on top of what uh mary has uh told us it was uh pointing out the fact that the harrison's bay company was acting like a pseudo government Mm -hmm. So that's okay. another layer uh, that we should know. That's right. That's right. It actually there was a transfer um, specific that that isn't that who Canada bought. I mean, isn't that who the government of Canada actually bought the land from? That's was right. that? I think that may have been the history. I think I'm sorry. I'm American, so I'm a. <laughs> When I think back on my Canadian history, sometimes it's a little bit shaky. But yeah, it's a really good point, Saku. I believe that maybe uh, more Canadians know that than I do, but um, than Americans. But um, it's interesting to think that it's not, it wasn't like where I come from, where a people rose up and decided they were going to create a country of their own. There was this kind of sideline transfer of land from uh, a royalty and a government across the pond mm -hmm. uh, that then, you know, gifted the land to a blanket company uh, or like, a, you know, a fur trading yeah. company. And then they just sold it to something called Canada. Yeah. Interesting. Is that and true? Is that actually the history as you all know it? I don't think I could tell you whether that was true or not because I don't know that piece of history. Oh, okay. Didn't the Hudson's Bay Company recently get sold to the States? That's a whole other thing. Oh, that's um, a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the irony of it all, right? right. We're gonna move. On. We're gonna move on to um, the next chapter, which is chapter seven. That's the Res House. So I will get uh, Rick to play that chapter. We're in the chapter called Incarceration. And of course, as I've explained throughout, there are many examples of the incarceration of indigenous bodies throughout 300 year history as we get up to the present. And of course, there still are far too many indigenous bodies incarcerated in prisons today in Canada. I believe indigenous people make up 4% of Canada's population and they're 30% in the prison system. So what you're seeing in this installation, it's called minimalism. And of course, it's also Kent Monkman making his critique of modern art. He very much loves the classic representational history paintings that he's been 
using that genre throughout this exhibit to re-embed Indigenous perspectives on the history of Indigenous-Canadian relations through representational painting. And so minimalism is his critique in this incarceration, in this installation of mischief incarcerated in prison, but also mischief as Leonard Peltier, who is a American Indian movement um, warrior who has been incarcerated in prison in the United States since the 60s, when he was probably incorrectly accused of killing two FBI agents. And he's been in prison his entire life. And you'll see later on um, in the exhibit, you'll see free LP, free Leonard Peltier. So you get these references, these real things about real people that have happened throughout the exhibition. The other thing that Ken Monkman talks about incarceration is that ironically, many indigenous people discover indigenous spirituality when they're in prison. That's when they have time to meet with indigenous elders and to learn about smudging and about sweat lodges and other means for indigenous resilience and health and spirituality. The other painting or the other artwork by Kent Monkman in this exhibition I absolutely love. It's called Reincarceration. And if you look at it closely, what you see is you've got that, you've got that typical sort of open wilderness kind of artwork that we're seeing in the West by people like Paul Kane, um, Albert Berstadt, but what you're seeing is the Mount Stony Penitentiary in the background, and you're seeing indigenous people leaving the penitentiary depicted as Giacometti sculptures. And that's another modern artist who created these sculptures of human beings, kind of like skeletons, very, very skeletal. And they're walking across the water and they're joining this circle of sun dancers. And then on, on the sides of them are these old rusty cars. So reincarceration, we're getting um, rebirth and renewal. And we're getting, getting out of incarceration. And I remember when Kent Monkman spoke about this piece, he said, you might think that these rusty old cars are a sign of garbage or of loss of hope. But actually, when you're on a reserve in the prairies, like in, outside of Winnipeg, where he's from in northern Winnipeg, uh, excuse me, northern Manitoba, these res cars, as he calls them, were your only means to get off the reserve. So these are another means for, for renewal and for uh, rebirth. Thank you. And thank you, Jennifer, for rem reminding me that we are on chapter six, not chapter seven, which is incarceration. So I misspoke there. So we're looking at two uh, pieces here. One is um, an installation again. So like the scent of a beaver off the top and um, that uh, installation. So Steph, uh, this was, there wasn't a lot of visual description here. So maybe you can just um, set the scene for us and, and set the visuals to this installation called minimalism. I'll try. Yes, it's a uh, it's like a a, a cube, a white cube-like prison cell. That's about it's not quite square, but it's almost eight feet by eight feet, and it's just a, it's not quite as deep. But uh, the two sides, the front and the right side, are uh, steel stainless steel bars, so we can see inside the cube. And the back walls and these the interior walls, the floor, the ceiling, everything's painted white. The the edging around the outside, everything's white. And the the so we've got stainless steel um, bars. And on the back wall, there are three stainless steel uh, steel ledges. But the main focus of the uh, interior is um, uh, the a prisoner who is uh, a life size. It's it's a mannequin who looks exactly like Kent Monkman on his knees and has long dark hair, partially braided. And he's, um, he's on his knees holding a feather, an eagle feather in one hand up. And he's looking at a window, a small square window that's high in the, in the wall that he's facing. And there's, uh, it's a frosted window, so you can't see out of it, but light is pouring in through that window. And in his other hand, he's holding a sage smudge. So as you watch and wander, and you can walk around the full um, 
cubit watching it from this side, the light through this window changes color. It cycles through a full spectrum, slowly cycling through this spectrum of green, blue, purple, violet, pink, red, orange, yellow, green, the whole, and then it just repeats. Okay. So that's... And I, 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 again, it just in the interest of time, friends, because we could be here talking about these images, they're so powerful. I, uh, Steph, I'd like you to just stick around and describe to us uh, reincarceration, which Jennifer um, did partly. But uh, when I witnessed this, I, I had great difficulty understanding what it looked like, and you had described it beautifully to me. So I'm, I'm hoping you can, Remember you know, reproduce that magic. <laughs> so again, we're, we have another massive landscape. So half the canvas is cloudy sky, and way in the distance is this is the prison that it's a uh, kind of gray institution along the horizon um, and coming across uh, the grass. So there's a river. And so that's on the far side of that riverbank. And then coming across through the grass towards the river and into the river are these, what Jennifer calls Giacometti figures. And so they are almost skeletal figures. He was famous for these sculptures of, of humans that were that were stick figures basically and almost skeletal. So these uh, figures are walking into the river and then they're coming up on this side, on the foreground side, on this side of the riverbank. And they're joining uh, a circle of, of, as she calls them, sun dancers. So they're wearing um, uh, skirts of different colors and holding up eagle feathers. And there's smoke uh, from their fire that's wafting through these figures. And as these skeletal figures join this circle, they gain flesh and they become part of the circle. Um, the, the cars on the um, scattered about, there's one, there are different sort of ages of cars. One looks like a 1970s Mustang to me with the hood up and there's vegetation growing through the engine and another looks like it might be from the forties and the door is sort of uh, ajar. And this side of the riverbank is, is uh, lush with grasses and trees and um, yeah, was that close? <laughs> Yeah, I know. It, it's great. I think for me, again, the imagery of these Giacometti type figures that like emerge from this penitentiary in the background, which um, because the way it's painted, I actually can't, there's no contrast for me. So it blends into the sky. I don't even know that it's there. Mm -hmm. um, so our friends with partial sight, there's this, you know, sky colored penitentiary in the background. Um, and these, so these, there's this symbolism. Um, of these figures sort of emerging or maybe even escaping from this prison and sort of rejoining um, their, their peoples, their families. Uh, Marie, you know, I'm going to you on this one. Um, and of course I'm coming to Asaku after this is, it's not a popularity contest, but I just, uh, Marie, what, what is, uh, am I going, am I getting somewhere with that imagery? Is that, uh, that's sort of how I'm witnessing this is that there's a, there, there, there's like a, a coming from a, a depletion to a to a rebirth kind of I, I think you've you've got it spot on um you know and once again in um his manuscript you he talks about just the numbers of people um indigenous the the population of indigenous people in these penitentiaries is outstanding you know they mm -hmm. make up the majority um claiming 46%, 65.3%, 63.9% of populations. And these are like modern statistics of uh, the indigenous um, representation in prisons. And it's not unlike uh, what uh, America sees with our black population. So um, I, I also wanted to just echo what, um, Steph was saying about the imagery in terms of these 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 bodies walking out of the penitentiary, finding culture is what it is that I'm seeing they find. They're finding who they are after going through this system that has depleted them down to skin and bones and almost robotic creatures as well, right? Um, they don't seem to have expressions like the other characters and figures, but instead, um, they're walking through this almost like a body of water meeting up with one another. And they do have eagle feathers. All of them are holding eagle feathers, which is um, 
your gifted eagle feathers, those are very, very sacred items that they're holding and they, they are um, celebrating in some way together. Um, I'd like to pass it on to Isaku. I'd like to hear what he has to say. Yes. For me, this is about regaining indigenous spirituality after the generations of uh, trauma, oppression, and uh, even in jail cell, um, he is finding indigenous spirituality in that difficult circumstance. So I think it's about resilience and rebirth, perhaps. Yeah, becoming a whole. I like that, becoming whole. What a metaphor that is, eh? I think I would like to point out at this moment in time that I really do wish that we had an Indigenous person on our panel mm -hmm. to help us go through this um, and give us their perspective. Because uh, I have experienced, I have been privileged enough to experience a lot of ceremony within um, Indigenous populations here in Vancouver. This must speak volumes and that we can't even comprehend to others. Right. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to take a look now at chapter seven. So I'm, I'm speaking correctly this time about chapter seven being the res house. So I'm going to get Rick to play chapter seven. We're in the chapter called the res house. And here you can see the installation of a drafty substandard res house but what you're seeing is basically another version of the birth of the baby jesus with mary on the left and joseph on the right but they're all wearing the face of kent monkman including the baby sitting on a hudson bay company blanket and as well this is also an interpretation of miss chief eagle testicle being born to her loving parents and so you're seeing this layering of meaning of christian meaning of the real practicalities of what life is like on reserve right now in Canada. So you see the bottled water because so many reserves do not have healthy drinking water. You see um, the substandard food like craft dinner and spam and tomato soup. You see Mary with her rosary that was actually created by Kent Monkman with a beaver on the cross as Jesus. And you may wonder, why is the face of Kent Monkman or Miss Chief on all of these, these people? Kent Monkman talked about visiting the American Museum of Natural History in New York City years ago and being shocked that every single life representation of indigenous people had the same face on it again and again and again. This stereotyping of indigenous people as if they were some kind of abstract non-individuals. So he's replaying that sort of returning the gaze by putting his own face in, in the scene. And this installation of the res house also has the words amor vincit omnia, which in Latin means love conquers all. And it's supposed to be really the theme of Christianity. And you can see these kind of stained glass like windows in this frame with the beaver with wings on it that sort of Kent Monkman plays with this idea of angels and angels beavers with angels, indigenous spirituality, and Christianity, and what does that mean, and what has it brought for indigenous people? And so you can see it in, the, in this chapter. This was one of the most interesting installations for me personally, um, and so I'm going to invite Steph to do some description here because there were a few things that were sort of glaringly obvious, even to me with my low vision, um, and, and obviously to the, the sighted crowd that this tour is being done for. Um, Steph, talk about the way that Mary and Joseph, and again, this is an installation, so these are like life-sized 3D mannequins. Uh, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, the reinvention of this. Talk about the way that Mary and Joseph are dressed. Right, so so the the baby is on the ground in uh, the Hudson Bay blanket, and so Mary's kneeling over over the baby with uh, uh, hands in prayer, and she's wearing a, just maybe track pants and uh, a bright blue hoodie that's pulled right over her, uh, covering her hair, and then inside there's like another white hoodie. So this layering of the white and the blue is very similar to how the Virgin 
um, Virgin Mary is is depicted in her in her blue veil. Um, and Joseph is standing over the baby uh, to her right, and he's wearing, you know, construction boots and black pants and a Chicago Blackhawks jersey. This is the NHL team, so it's a it's a red jersey with uh, black and white stripes. But the logo on the on the chest is of an indigenous head in profile with feathers, and it's been rendered here in beadwork, so it's traditional um, beadwork. And it looks a little bit like Miss Chief uh, because, because the face doesn't have, in the logo, the, the face has um, sort of war paint, if you can still use that term, but that's what it looks like on the logo itself. That's gone in this depiction, but we've got lipstick and a little, it looks like a little blue eyeshadow and, and, and an earring, I think, you know. So I would guess that that might be Miss Chief, perhaps. And Joseph has two long black braids as well hanging. And he's wearing a black uh, black baseball cap, and on the baseball cap, it looks like uh, dream dream catchers designs embroidered on. Okay, so there's a there's a real powerful statement here, and I could try and articulate my feelings about this, but I'm going to come up with all the wrong words. Um, and I don't, I you know, maybe somebody who knows more about sports than I do, I have I think that this jersey has been retired. And even the team name, I think, is either has been retired or is under consideration for retirement and renaming, um, as it has been some of our other Canadian and American um, big sports teams, clubs. Um, so, Marie, unpack this a little bit for us, because there's lots of, of um, maybe the invasion of colonialism or, or modernity here. Uh, and there's a real juxtaposition here. Maybe it's a... I, I, I don't want to take the words out of your mouth, so please. Well, um, I'm not particularly a pious person. I, I haven't um, studied religion very carefully, so I can't really pick apart the nuances there for you. But I can tell you um, what I'm seeing um, through the details of looking at these imagery is that um, and, and the video actually does, by the way, uh, Rhea Saxena is the person who um, shot and edited the video that you're watching. Awesome. Um, it, it was beautifully done. Um, she, she really moves close into the details and what you're seeing there is spam, you're seeing canned milk, you're seeing Coca-Cola, you're seeing bottled water, jerry cans, and beyond just what they're wearing, which is you know, a very, I would call it Americanized as a North Americanized style um, with, you know, incorporated different kinds of beadwork and obviously like owning, owning this culture themselves in a way as well. Mm. What you see, and I think what's represented here is what these people in the, in, 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 on reservations actually have and what they have, as far as I understand, are substances that aren't necessarily food they're food product right yeah. we're not we're and even if you go really far up north into some of the reserves in the yukon you want to get a jug of milk and you're going to be paying 30 dollars for it mm -hmm. right so not only have um you know you see all this beautiful land in the back but this picture that we're looking at right now doesn't actually do the piece justice because what you're seeing is this kind of ornate imagery on the outside that looks like something that you would see in a church. But as you move around to the side, you see that it's just plywood and tarps. And when you look in through the side of the, the image, if, if you look close down, you see lath and plaster that's over on the right hand of the image. So it's just walls that are falling apart inside of these houses. And I'm not entirely sure what the correlation between the religious um, aspect of this imagery is and the sheer poverty that you're seeing inside of it, but there's certainly something to be said there. Um, Isako, do you know more about this piece? Um, I'm going to talk about a few other things. Okay. <laughs> I can confirm that, yes, that is Miss Chief. There's an initial MC in her hair. If you can zoom in, if you have that photo on the j jersey, yes. See, you see MC and also penis oh. ejaculating. Oh, my goodness, I didn't even... <laughs> wow, Isaku. <laughs> 
Yes, and also the uh, food uh, by the windowsill. They've got uh, price tags on them. And I do not remember the exact price on them, spam and other items. There are uh, I don't know, $18 per can of uh, one of those things. Mm -hmm. And also on the floor, there is a uh, bottle with dirty water on it. Uh, yes, I think uh, that was uh, right by the baby. So the water in it in it is dirty. So yes, layer of reality in mm -hmm. art showing up. Right. And actually, I just noticed uh, a detail that I haven't seen before as we were zooming down. Uh, Ria, if you could zoom back up on the background of this, the painting. In the background, you can see a nun. It's like another element of the scream. And Mengpin does this a lot. He refers to his own artistry and other works. You see a nun pulling uh, what looks like a child away from a, a house, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got these people who are, you know, they're forced to stay on a certain part of land. They're not allowed to roam their territory and get food like they used to be able to. And this happens today, folks. Um, they're, they're, they're required to eat this, this, you know, food product that the government gives them or sells to them for extremely high prices. And then people come into their homes and this does happen today and say, oh, and they say, well, you can't take care of your kids. So we're going to take them away. And this is both historical and present. And that's what I'm actually seeing from, um, the kind of like modern regalia, as you would call it, that uh, Chief uh, Miss Chief is wearing here. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it's uh, it, it's again all of Kent Monkman's images are extremely powerful, and you can draw so much from the layers that are um, some of them really evident, and some of them almost like. Um, like a, like a game of hide and seek, right? Like what, what can we reveal next? Um, which I, I think is, <laughs> I don't often say this because I, I am completely happy with where I am in my life, but sometimes I wish I had better eyes to see this kind of stuff with, um, to appreciate those details. But that's why we have you find folks with us to be able to witness some of these things through your peepers. Um, I wanna take a look at chapter eight, which is sickness and healing. And we're gonna get Rick to play chapter eight and then we're gonna come back and unpack that a little bit. We're in the chapter titled Sickness and Healing. And I think it's very appropriate actually to talk about this chapter now during the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all experiencing. So one of the things that's been made abundantly clear to me is that indigenous people in Canada have had a lot of experience with plagues. So you see Miss Chief saying right here, I remember the first catastrophes, the dark days of the epidemics. We had no resistance to the European plagues of smallpox, influenza and measles that ravaged our communities. But then at the end of her statement, she says, I visit my people to bring them the solace of our spirituality, that they may rise up at, out of this cycle of destruction, learn the language of their souls, and be free once more. So here you have Ken Monkman talking about these themes of sickness and healing, indigenous resilience, rebirth, strengthening, strengthening through bringing their language back, strengthening through learning their spirituality. And this painting, is called The Death of the Virgin after Caravaggio. And Caravaggio has a very famous painting of the death of the Virgin Mary. But here, Kent Monkman has put a trans person in a hospital bed, a contemporary hospital bed. We don't know whether they have passed away due to suicide, due to AIDS, due to overdose, all problems that we are experiencing here. But what you see surrounding this person is the love of their family, indigenous spirituality. And so he's, Kent Monkman is, is balancing this, the strength of indigenous spirituality, Christianity, um, different types of healing. 
Okay, um, Steph, I'll get you to join us again and just to share some of the visual details of this particular piece. Um, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna throw it to you because there aren't a lot of questions I can ask because I, I don't know what's going on here. Right. So it's it it doesn't it's uh, the the hospital bed is traditional, um, but the room looks it's dark gray kind of mottled walls and uh, um, and there's this swag of uh, green fabric in the top corner. So um, and the light is is shining on the figures around the bed. So the the figure is uh, um, has one arm hanging off the bed and her face, his or her, their face is turned. She's surround, they are surrounded by nine figures, I believe. Um, and one is at the kneeling at the foot of the bed, a young man and uh, two women crouching on the other side of the bed, holding their face, covering, partially covering their faces. In the corner, there's an elder holding an eagle feather and, um, the, and smudging. And um, another young man holds a drum and uh, an older man is, is gazing down at the figure in the bed and he's holding something to his chest that might be um, a medicine pouch. Um, yeah, I would... Um... So Steph, is the only reference of modern medicine in this piece the bed? Because when I think of a hospital scene, I think of IV poles and monitors and you know all those kinds of things that you find in a, a big modern day hospital. Do we, do we see any of that in this particular piece? No, just uh, there, there, there is a chair beside the bed. Uh, that's right. Not, but that's yeah. It's, otherwise, it's quite um, bare. Again, the, the walls are not the traditional hospital walls. They're okay. more um, this. Um, I think our guests can probably speak more about the references. What yep. the other painting that he's referencing here? Wonderful. All right, Marie. You know, I'm coming to you about references and and what's what's being shared with us in this particular piece. And I, I'm going to let you unpack that a little bit and then I have a very specific question for you. Yeah. So um, Monkman is a fan of Caravaggio. Um, if, if people don't know who he is, um, he's an Italian painter who was very well known uh, during the Renaissance. Um, for his chiaroscuro, which means light and dark. And it was just this way of painting that was extremely vibrant in color and contrast. And he would often depict um, horrific images of people being murdered or you know, like scenes that had strong striking um, beams of light running through. And so this, this image is almost, a, it's like a remake, it's a modern remake of a, a Caravaggio painting. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually wanna pass it off to Isaku because Isaku has done a little bit of research on this one um, right. for a, a, a tour that he was recently putting together with um, a professor named June. Um, June, would you like to, I mean, sorry, <laughs> Isaku, would you like to talk more <laughs> about this piece? So um, th uh, this is, a young um, transgender person in bed. So this is pointing um, the fact that we have murdered missing indigenous women, girls, um, two-spirit people. So that's one thing in bed. And again, resiliency of indigenous healing and spirituality in face of this difficult difficult reality is uh, what I, what I'm uh, uh, experiencing. Great. And you are right. Um, uh, throughout the image, you see very little in the way of modern medicine. And what you do see is um, a medicine, a person clutching their medicine pouch on their chest in the foreground on the left. You see a person behind him drumming. You see um, another person in the corner smudging and praying. Um, and all the while, if you get really close into the imagery, like on a lot of the um, paintings in this section, people have tattoos and on those, in those tattoos, there, there is deep significance um, attached to each person. Hmm. Wow. Uh, again, the level of detail is is quite amazing. So here's my my specific Caravaggio was one of them. So thank you for unpacking that. I'm curious. 
Miss Chief doesn't seem to be in this one, or is she? And we had talked about earlier that she sometimes is hidden, but it wasn't obvious to me. She wasn't described in an obvious way. Is she here? Is she not here? That's a really good question. I, I actually do not see Miss Chief in this painting. And I think that um, June would say that there's a significance in that as well. Right. Um, before in the scream, one thing that we didn't, we failed to mention that is that there are ravens and um, Miss Chief does sometimes show up as a raven. Um, but uh, I would, I would leave this one with the big, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure if Miss Chief is a part of this moment or if she is, um, if we are in her perspective of looking and seeing. Oh, I never even thought about that. As, 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 as this is like the filter through her eyes kind of thing. Maybe. Interesting. Asaku, any last thoughts on this before we no, head into chapter nine? Yeah, thank you. I do have, Amy, sorry, just one detail because it's Siobhan brings it up and I do. There are so many details in this, uh, in this painting. Thank you, Siobhan, for, um, for that. We could spend yeah. hours on each painting, right? I know we could, but in an important element is there is a blanket draped at the, at the foot of the bed where the, where the young man is kneeling. And it's a blanket, it's a, it's a version of a Hudson Bay blanket. They had many versions. Uh, this one is beige ah. with a green stripe. So yet again, the Hudson's Bay blanket makes an appearance here. A version hmm. of it, yeah. A version of it, yeah. Any idea uh, what, I don't want to say what time period, but is this before or after the sort of iconic, do we know? The iconic Hudson's Bay blanket that is, I, I only I only knew there, there as being one version of it. So I'm, I'm curious, this must have preceded the version that they're selling mass marketing today, that, that pattern. They've had an all all kinds of different patterns. The 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 classic stripe one that has been they've been producing it all along, and then they have yeah. kind of special edition ones, I think. Um, but the the all of the the people, uh, uh, all the family members, and uh, are wearing contemporary clothes, jeans, and young men's right. and hoodie, and uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. But it is a good point. Uh, it, and, and again, so wonderful to be having this experience with people that to, uh, to point out things that I just completely missed as I walked through this exhibit over and over again. The blanket at the end that does indeed seem like a husband's blanket. Um, again, just to remind everyone the significance of a blanket. You know, um, it, it is a really special item. It's not just for keeping you warm. Um, so there probably is a deeper meaning there and it may even have something to do with um, this young individual passing into another stage of existence. Right. Okay, I promised to Saku the last word, so. Oh, I have nothing to add. I think everything's been said. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right, we'll take a look at chapter nine then. So Rick, let's play the final chapter of the tour, please. The final chapter in this exhibition, Shame and Prejudice, A Story of Resilience, is called The Urban Res. And here, Kent Monkman has depicted the streets of the North End of his home, his, where he was raised in Winnipeg, which is most by population indigenous. And he's telling many, many layers and stories in these monumental paintings. He's combining the real streets, the real houses, the real BC hydro poles, but he's showing them, for example, depicted as First Nations Northwest Coast totem poles, or he's showing, for example, in this painting called seeing red, and he has such wonderful titles to his paintings. You get Miss Chief as a bullfighter, carrying a Hudson Bay Company blanket in all of her beautiful Athabascan beaded uh, gear, and of course her Lebutan high heels, fighting not a uh, bull, but a bison, and a bison that looks a lot like the way perhaps Picasso would have depicted a bison. And Kent Monkman is very much critiquing again the ideas of modern art, saying that they don't represent people fully, in fact, that they flatten people. And we'll see, if you look at other paintings in this series, that he's created women flattened in Picasso cubist style to show that they've been kind of pushed, flattened out of their strength. And so here is Picasso who saw himself 
very much as a bull, depicted himself as a bull, and very misogynist in Kent Monkman's. Um, so here is Miss Chief fighting this Picasso bull. And then you get an angel, or perhaps uh, Mercury, um, god of war, but also looking a bit angelic with the, with the wings, um, flowing down onto this moment of, with lots of things happening. There's a deceased bullfighter, we think, down here in the corner. There are the buffalo dance that we saw in the second chapter, Starvation, that George Catlin interpreted, but you've got them here coming back into this real life contemporary scene. So again, Kent Monkman is layering this meaning, referencing old paintings, paintings that stereotyped indigenous people as perhaps vanishing or as leaving these lands, not able to deal with modernity. And instead, Kent Monkman is saying, uh, no, contemporary life, indigenous people are here and they can pull back all the way to their past cultures, all the way into the present. They're fully modern. Um, in other paintings in this series, they're wearing very luxury brand clothing, um, bags or fancy shoes. So you're seeing full contemporary lives. And you're also seeing um, lots of use of indigenous regalia, indigenous spirituality, and Christianity, angels, and animals as well, like bears and eagles, coming down to rescue. So all of that is coming to play in the Urban Res series. And I'll end it here. You have to come and see it yourself because there are four incredible paintings in the Urban Res series, but they layer, they're layered with meaning. They show the realities of indigenous lives in Canada, but they also reference all these history paintings, all these themes, these themes of plenty and poverty, these themes of indigenous spirituality and Christianity, these themes of sexuality as something to celebrate, indigenous sexuality. And I'm going to end it there, but this story doesn't end. This, this exhibit is a response to Canada's 150 celebration. But it's also a response to the truth and reconciliation calls to action in 2015 that say that indigenous and non-indigenous people are responsible for reconciliation and restitution to what happened and is ongoing happening to indigenous peoples here in this country. I'm happy to take questions. That was great. Uh, I guess I'll officially thank Dr. Jennifer Kramer for the uh, virtual tour of the of the highlights of the exhibit and I don't even think you can call them highlights because it's not like there are highlights and lowlights but there are like some specifics um, through the exhibit so again there's a ton going on in this piece and it was one of my favorite pieces as well and so when I originally asked Steph to describe it to me I had a ton of questions about things that I thought I saw that I didn't quite see that I thought I heard Jennifer say and needed more reference on so I'm going to invite Steph back to describe some of the major um, elements of this, but can you just start with like the overall setting stuff that we're looking at here and then maybe narrow it down to some details? Yeah. So in, in this ninth chapter, the urban res, these, um, these four massive canvases are, are, I think they're depicting neighborhoods in the north end of Winnipeg. So we have an urban setting. So the the, the road is where the bullfight is happening and there's cracked pavement. And in the background, there are, um, you know, sort of working class homes, I guess you would call them kind of closely packed together as chain link fence. They're tagged with graffiti here and there. It looks, there's not a lot of greenery except for this vacant lot behind them. Um, so in the street, we have, uh, we have mischief in, in um, the, uh, the matador outfit that she's wearing is sort of a bolero jacket and the, and the toreador pants are very, very tight fitting. So she's, she's following that tradition, but the fabric is absolutely sheer red with this beading that Jennifer mentions, the Athabasca beading and her high Louboutin shoes. She's kind of uh, looking over her shoulder, almost in our direction. 
And the, the bull, of course, that, that Jennifer mentions is done in that Picasso style. It's been stabbed repeatedly with, uh, uh, it has a number of uh, the bender, ben, uh, benderias, I think they're called. They're like harpoons that are stuck in its, uh, in its hump and it's, it's bleeding and uh, there's blood splashed on the pavement. It's collapsing onto its, onto its forelegs and its uh, face is in a you know, grimace of, uh, you know, uh, agony or rage and um, behind it on the street there are two bison standing and they seem rather calm in comparison and they seem to be looking at us and very calm on the street and um, so that's right happening in the road and then alongside so behind this scene uh, the in the sort of close to the what would be the gutter but behind Miss uh, Chief is the dead matador and, and there's a um, an indigenous youth uh, sort of crouching over the body and then there are two other youths racing down the street and one of them is carrying an eagle feather and a smudge and the other is, is uh, seems to be beating a drum and they're running and they're looking over their shoulder. They're not looking at the bison in the street, they're looking up into the sky and in the, to the top left-hand corner of the canvas, there is a police helicopter there. Um, so there's right. a lot going on. And then uh, still on that side of the canvas behind the graffitied walls, there looks like what looks like a prison guard tower in the, in the background. And then going back to the vacant lot, in the, there's, uh, there's some grasses and weeds and a car and behind the car, there are flames shooting out. And this is where the Buffalo dancers are gathered near the, near the fire there. And they're wearing, so they have bison heads and uh, they're carrying shields and wearing uh, colorful loincloths. And again, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, this is kind of a reference to an, another painting done by a settler. Um, and then, in the, and then, of course, the the, the hydro pole is a totem pole. Uh, it looks like a thunderbird is uh, near the top. So it's a regular pole, and then it become and the carvings are near the top in a thunderbird design, I believe. And then hanging on the wires are um, near this a uh, floating figure, this angelic uh, Mercury figure. Uh, the a pair of Adidas sneakers have been thrown over the hydro wires, and the, these sneakers have wings on them. So that's in a quick nutshell, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on and, and we can't possibly get through all the details, but I think, pardon the pun, it paints a good picture um, in our minds of all of the different details that are here. So again, I, you know, I have some real specific questions when I, when I hear things like the symbolism of the shoes thrown over the wire. That's something that um, when I had the privilege of having my, my site, used to see in neighborhoods all over town. And never, I, I mean, this is my naivete used to be like, why would anybody tie their shoes and throw them over the wire? How does that possibly happen? Um, and it's just a, a small detail, but I, I, Marie, I'm going to ask you what the reference is to that. You know, it's funny because that's exactly what I look at when I see this image. I always look at the sneakers and interesting. And the reason that I look at that is because it's a direct reference to the piece that's next to it in the show, which is the res house. Yeah. Um, the, um, the kneeling figure is wearing these shoes and these specific Adidas shoes, I remember when they came out uh, a few years back uh, along with a bunch of other um, Adidas clothing that was all styled after Northwest Coast um, art. So, and a lot of them kind of turned in like jackets and shoes kind of represented this totem poly like slash angelic look that some people thought was you know really cool and others thought was extremely offensive um so okay. when i see these these sneakers thrown over the wire and generally what it means is that back in the day when you couldn't buy your weed <laughs> at the local um, shop and you had to figure out where somebody was selling whatever drug it was that you were looking for, you look for telephone, you look for a telephone pole with shoes on them. And I'm not entirely yeah. sure. And I think in this particular section of the show, and even like it be the 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 general messaging, even when we were talking to Kent about these specific images, he 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 creates in general generalities. He's 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 kind of ev evoking this questioning of 
what is then and now um, we've got an angel who has these these same kind of wings on it but the angel is white we're not really sure who this angel is and why they're looking down on this population that this these white um angels show up quite a few times through this yeah. section of the collection and um i did ask kent at one at one point why do these white angels have indigenous tattoos and he was saying um, that part of the critique is that so much has been stolen from indigenous populations, including things like um, their artistry. And mm -hmm. uh, if I if I may, um, he does talk in his manuscript again about um, indigenous artistry being one of the most um, one of the healthiest signs that there is rejuvenation, there is life, there is resilience with the indigenous, within the indigenous populations. Um, so I, I wonder if this is kind of a critique on the chaos that is the world uh, now. Interesting. Uh, that's all I've got for it right now. Asaka, you, how about you? I mean, this yes. is again, um, a lot going on in this painting. So what sticks out for you? Uh, uh, I think it's reflecting back to us again, settler like me, Ken Bunkman saying, um, indigenous people exist in urban settings. They're not just pushed to uh, in somebody's edge of the mines. They're, they exist here. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, Ken Bunkman is asking us to recognize perhaps the urban place you're living do you know whose traditional land that is? Right. Uh, and, but uh, the bull I would like to talk about <laughs> is, that is the Picasso's bull, obviously. But for me, that is um, mischief, slaying toxic masculinity. Oh, he interesting. Is, he is, uh, she is the decolonized sexualities uh, manifestation and that sexual fluidity and uh, diverse sexual range and um, acceptance of those uh, uh, variant sexual orientations in indigenous cultures. Uh, so the mod modern uh, modernists are flattening uh, not just uh, two-spirit people, but women, even men, I think, are flattened. I think what I take from that flattening is dehumanizing. So it's range of who you are shrinks. So right. man becomes uh, somebody who wants to be masculine. So the you know that becomes uh, yes, I want to be uh, masculine. So that becomes more toxic and so on, but there she is slaying it in front of everybody, police is up there, mm -hmm. uh, witnesses are there. Um, yeah, that's how, what I take from this. It, it's quite, uh, quite a profound image. And yet again, you know, Monkman asks us to consider so many different themes, um, to pick out things that resonate with us as well. So it's an invitation to not only witness, but to find things in my, I, this is my hope that I'm interpreting this correctly, but even find things that we can, um, like this, the us together right now are bonding over this artwork as human beings, spending time with each other, learning about each other, witnessing each other's perspectives. And I think part of what he's asking us to do in his artwork is keep the conversation going, um, which I think is super, super important. And we're going to keep the conversation going if you're willing to stick around for a few more minutes because we went a little over time, but uh, we, we had to, to, to do justice to these pieces for all of our guests that were joining us today. But I'm going to open it up to anybody in the audience who has some specific questions, mm -hmm. any of our friends from the blind community who has some specific questions about description or themes. Um, and I'm going to get... Uh, Steph's with me. She's going to help with the, I know there's been a lot of stuff happening in the, ch in the chat, but this blind girl can't follow what's happening in the chat function. So, so 
Yeah, thanks, Amy. Uh, there's been there have been some lots of comments in the chat. And first of all, the first one I want to address is the um, uh, to acknowledge that we we did not have the resources, the time to bring an Indigenous person into onto the panel here. And this, uh, you know, I, I I can only take response. I have a time. This is a this is all new for us. This is a Vocalize a really tiny organization and we, uh, you know, what do they say, the best intention, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so mm. I'm on my way there, I know. <laughs> um, it's So please accept our, our, our deep apologies for that. I had no idea that this would actually, you know, be reaching beyond our, our, our community. Um, and we are in partnership with the Museum of Anthropology. And so we're, you know, kind of working with the resources that we had on a cr crunchy timeline. So. Um, it sounds like feeble excuses. Please accept my apologies. I um, I wanted to also um, share some of the comments about the um, the 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 running shoes over the wires. So here, starting from so um, one person says it's not true. This was used in Black communities in the USA when someone in the community was killed. Oh. Um, and then someone continues, it's, it's been co-opted by popular culture to vilify and demonize the black community. And it has been culturally appropriated much like the graffiti in the background and saying this is depicting a place to buy drugs is problematic and so on. And this is vilifying indigenous folks. Symbolism is murder and death of an angel, especially with the angel wings. So I please, I invite uh, the people who've made these comments in, in, in the chat, if you feel comfortable to speak to us, please, please, please do. Not seeing any, <clears throat> excuse me, hands up um, in our our raised hand function. Oh, of course, what harm being done to the black community? What do we plan to do going forward? I don't want to hear just apologies. I don't blame you. Um, so I can tell you what Vocalize is doing. Like one of the things that we've been talking about recently is like, we're so aware of um, the describers that um, are like, because again, I have a theater background and, and all of that. So um, we are, you know, not diverse enough and what I'm wanting to do and starting in the new year is we're going to be creating some training op opportunities and mentorships to, um, to, to offer training, uh, describer training to people who are from diverse backgrounds, people of color, indigenous people, uh, LGBTQ people, so that we can diversify the voices of people that are doing what I was doing tonight, describing things. And, um, and to offer that, to offer scholarships for people, anybody who wants to do that. So if anybody on the call is interested in that, please let us know. These are going to, these, this is something that a project that I'm working on funding for to, to happen in the new year. So that's kind of uh, what Vocalize is doing. We do recognize that this is, um, yeah, a, a problem and we want to do something about it. There's student, we, the, the, the point of view of the describer is is what I'm bringing my biases and my conditioning and all of this with me, and uh, you know, and the limitations are 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 vast. So, may may I just do one thing, <laughs> Marie? Just... Marie, please, and then we have a couple of hands. So go ahead, Marie. Uh, yes. Um, so we have had a few conversations about this show. This one's being recorded. And um, the one that we just did with this Saku um, last week was with June. And she is a professor at SFU. And she is an Indigenous woman um, who has helped us walk through the show. So if anybody would like to hear her perspective, many of the ones that I shared today were actually ones that I learned while doing the tour with her. Um, so I really encourage you to go online and check out that video. Um, we also had um, another talk with Monkman himself at the very opening of the show. Um, and that was, um, that was done with a, an indigenous organization um, that uh, grants scholarship to indigenous artists and up and comers. So um, I do encourage you to go on the MOA website and um, hear, it from, hear, hear it from indigenous people as well. And we'll be sending out links to all of these all of these resources in our follow up email. So please let's. And I it. also do want to apologize um, for my misunderstanding of what um, sneakers on a wire mean to some people. 
My apologies. Thanks, Marie. Thanks for that, Marie. Um, Steph, can I invite some of these hands? Yes. Um, okay, so uh, there's somebody here listed as simply iPhone, and I, I don't know who that is, but if you know who you are, because you have your hand raised, I welcome you to unmute yourself. Just give it a, a moment. And then after we hear from that person, we will invite Faye and Siobhan to ask a question. iPhone? Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to Faye then because it looks like iPhone has, has stepped away from their comment. Faye, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question or register your comment? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, it can you hear me? I'm, okay. I'm Faye. O okay, okay. What I'm, uh, uh, I'm a Métis girl and I was raised around the, and I thought you guys did a super, super job. And sometimes I think, uh, I know how hard you guys work, and I think sometimes you don't have the time to invite somebody that's Indigenous, and I think it was excellent. Thank you, Faye. We, we wanted the blind community to be aware that this art existed, and this is just a springboard to future learnings on, on this type of topic, so thank you for your comment. Um, I'm muted with Nancy. Oh, there you go, Nancy. Nancy was iPhone. Okay, Nancy, go ahead, and then we'll we'll check I with love Siobhan. it. I love that you guys brought the the uh, Hudson Bay uh, blanket. I always wanted one, but it's good that it shows about Canada. The other thing is, I really loved. I my friend and my uh, son is Native too, right. and um, I learned Aboriginal about my um, the family. But I know a friend that was. Um, with a uh, priest had raped her way back and the mother kept telling the story and that brought back so much memory. Thank you for sharing that because how they suffered and then how they, at the end, they won their case and about being molested, the children in school. But the native stuff was perfect. You guys did an awesome job. And I like the feather because my son, every time he graduated with his native feather, it meant he's moving forward. And that's because he's Aboriginal. And that's what mm -hmm. they do is they're really in June. And it's a wonderful service. That, that feather means a lot. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing. Thank you for things. sharing that, Nancy. So the, the theme, the reoccurring theme of the eagle feather really resonated with you. It did. It did. What I hear. It did. Thank you for sharing. Um, Siobhan, I welcome you to unmute yourself and um, ask your question or register your comment. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for this tour and taking us through these wonderful pieces. Um, I love uh, Monkman's work. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit because I was one of the people uh, putting things in the chat. And it's just, uh, it's a, as we um, identify and uplift um, a, a particular community, in this case, the Indigenous community, um, it's ever so important that we carry an awareness of if we're um, accidentally or um, uh, unknowingly uh, uh, perpetrating a uh, invisibilization of another community. Um, the Black community's history and struggle within Canada still um, is largely invisibilized all mm -hmm. the way from the history of uh, enslavement being in Canada to uh, modern day occur occurrences. And so the pieces that were shared about the sneakers and about Picasso um, uh, you know, and and uh, the theft of African artwork not being identified in terms of his style. When we reference that without bringing that full awareness into the dialogue, it continues to perpetuate a degree of anti-Black racism and a degree of invisibilization that I'm sure wasn't the intent, but um, needs to in uh, all equity seeking um, endeavors, uh, be part of what we strive towards. So again, thank you for this evening. And um, I just wanted uh, an opportunity to speak a little bit to the comments so they weren't just uh, flat and two-dimensional um, uh, in their significance. Thank you, Siobhan, for, for providing um, some context around the comments. I think that's really helpful. And also, um, 
you know, I can speak for myself only. Um, a lot of these, these um, discussions are very new to me and I am really excited to learn and to continue the conversation um, in, in safe places. So thank you so much for providing the context to that and for educating about that. I really appreciate that. If I, if I may just speak uh, directly to Saban as well. Um, thank you for bringing it up, Saban. And I did see your note there um, as Isaku was talking about this painting in particular and the Picasso piece, and you're spot on. Actually, when I was speaking about the shoes and um, uh, their culture being objectified and taken um, and, and utilized for profit by the Adidas company, the same thing happened with Picasso. And you're absolutely right. Um, uh, I think that Monkman does speak specifically about that within this manuscript that I keep referencing because I don't really wanna speak on his behalf, but because um, it's pretty hard to <laughs> given the subject matter that we have, but all of your points are spot on. And I hear you when you say that um, Yes, highlighting one culture um, sometimes does uh, make others more invisible. And I don't think that you're alone um, when it comes to that opinion. I know that you're not. And I don't think that you're alone when it comes to critiquing Monkman's work in that way specifically. Um, so uh, if you've got any questions um, for me specifically, or if you'd like to get in contact with me specifically, I do have some articles that I can share with you that you might find really interesting. And I just make a comment. Hi, my name is Kui Binakamura. I'm one of the curators at the MOA. Actually, me and Marie have been actually discussing exactly about this issue, how Monkman depict other communities, especially Black people. Because in more his recent work, which are not part of this particular exhibition, we actually find it a little bit problematic how actually depict certain group of people. I'm also secular, I'm a person of color myself. So we have actually talking about it. We haven't managed to organize anything yet around this topic, but there might be an event around that exact topic. So yeah, please stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you for that. And you know, just want to remind folks that um, uh, those of us who live with blindness and partial sight, because we don't see the complexity of these images ourselves um, rely on oftentimes the perspective of whose ever eyes are guiding us through the experience and um, it's so valuable to have as many eyes as possible that see different things that relate different ways so that um, I mean my experience is so much fuller having had the perspective of of Steph's description and Marie and and Asaku and Siobhan and all the different voices around this table. And so as a person with sight loss, I wanna extend my thank you for the education and for the experience because otherwise this type of content is not available to me at all in any context. Um, and so I, I, I have a loss of all of these ideas uh, because they, they're not, you know, they're all transferred through sight. So uh, thank you everyone for your, your graciousness and sharing your perspectives and your thoughts and your um, your education around things that are so much bigger than than me and all of us we can't possibly know everything and I love the the space to learn I love that um, any last questions from our, our guests on the line um, if not we'll we'll move on to um, our, our vocal line members and our, our evening draw can I make a comment yes absolutely please um, I just wanted to appreciate what Siobhan was saying before, because I think it's a good perspective. Yeah. Um, even intersectionally within the disability community, we kind of like to say nothing about us without us, because there's a certain degree on when you talk about a person in an objectifying way from the point of view of an expert, whether it's art history or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it is very objectifying. And especially if we're looking at Kent Monkman's art, I think you really have to pay attention to who is the interpreter and what eyes they're seeing and what whose gaze it is. Right. So I just, um, you know, I'd like to see some, the perspectives. I appreciate all the per perspectives that came forward tonight, but I would like to see something a little bit closer to a Monkman sensi sensibility because I think there's a, a lot of nuance that's lost when we look at something through settler eyes, which is not something absolutely neutralizing settlers. So, yeah, but thanks a lot. I really appreciate being able to um, 
appreciate this art without going anywhere. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I appreciate that. Well, I don't see any other hands. So I think what I'll do at this point is uh, with my deepest thanks to everybody for, for joining us this evening, uh, Marie and Asaku uh, for being our, um, our lens through this, this process and for Steph for adding the um, expertise of the description that, that the blind community is um, dependent on and done so well for, um, it, it's created in, the description is created and curated um, in such a way that is is uh, what the blind community um, sort of requires out of description. So so sometimes for some people, it can it, it can be difficult to listen to, but it's 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 what 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 we require to be able to participate in the discussion. So thank you, Marie. Thank you, Asaku. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for joining us. Um, before we let Asaku go. Oh, now I can't remember. Is it Marie? Marie, are you doing our draw or is Asaku doing our draw? I asked you this before and now I forget. It's Marie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to do a quick draw here tonight. We, we finish each each event with a draw for members, Vocali members who live in, in British Columbia. Um, so I'm going to invite Donna on and we're going to let our MOA representative Marie do the draw. And tonight's draw is for a $25 gift card to Moose's Down Under Pub. Uh, Mooses has been extremely supportive of the blind community and so in these COVID times when they're struggling a little bit we wanted to uh, help support where we can so Donna where are you there you are what's your container tonight Donna um to, I'm back on the food containers and um it's uh it's my old kimchi jar oh fancy yeah. Back on food. All right, so Marie, I have put the names in. I am shuffling them. And whenever you'd like, please say stop. Stop. <laughs> right. And the winner is, oh, she won something else recently. I think uh, she's she's got, it's Josie. It's Josie. Wasn't Josie just the winner of the 50-50? Yeah, she's maybe got some luck. My, if my memory goes back that far. Congratulations, Josie. You've got a $25 gift card to Moose's Down Under Pub. So we'll make sure that you you um, get your gift card that doesn't expire. So there's no rush, but Karina would certainly love to, to see some familiar faces down there. So with that, my friends, you are welcome to carry on with your lovely Wednesday evening. Members of the blind community, if you would like to stick around and just have a, a little social chin wag, a little community gathering, you're most welcome to stay on the call. Otherwise, I will wish everybody a lovely evening and thank you for joining us uh, this evening for Kent Monkman's virtual, virtual tour of Kent Monkman's exhibit. Mm -hmm.